Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and today you will laugh until your face is hurt, because welcome to another episode of Jim Cornette's drive Through, right here, from my squeaky chair to yours, on this fall day. Beautiful, but it's getting cold, especially in the morning. I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and the man who will be joining me to review professional wrestling, and the man who will be answering your questions, the star of the drive through Mr. Jim Cornette. Thank you very much, Willard Scott, meteorologist on staff here. It's getting cool in the mornings, but later on we'll have cloud cover moving in, a 30% chance of showers by Wednesday. And then Thursday, that cold front comes in, folks. It's going to be nippy. It's going to be nippy with a chance of nuclear fire showers by Saturday afternoon. And now the sports. Here are the baseball scores, 6-2, to 4-3, to 7-5, and a partial score, 6. Back to you, Brian. Okay, well, we have questions and reviews here, and of course you are, if I'm Woodward Scott, I don't know if that makes you Bryant Gumble here on the show, but... I'm, I'm Bryant Mumble. Okay, we can go with that as your new character. Hello, lady. You know what we ought to do on this show? We ought to just fucking uh, play the past 10 minutes of shit that we recorded that, that we can't play because we're just laughing at each other because we're completely, both of us, insane. And then the question becomes, how do we do a show after this? Because we're already broken. Yes, we're, <laughs> we're already broken. <laughs> we're broken and, until you're broken and bleeding. And your body is broken and bleeding and laying in a gut, old Anderson. It will never be over. It will never be over. This show will never be over. Until you are down in the gutter there, Brian, last with your squeaky chair. The big news, have we, we might as well tell them at the top of the program here about the big news that I revealed on my popular program, uh, the Jim Cornette Experience, just a few days ago that I'm working in conjunction now with Heritage Auctions. Um, you remember this big news, Brian? Yes, I heard it yes. seemingly days ago. Yes. Seemingly just a couple of days ago. <laughs> um, and it, it it ties into you because it is a wrestling news product that is going to be auctioned, a pro wrestling enterprises product, and you are the repository of that fine archive now. But... Uh, if you didn't hear the experience this past weekend, it actually it was almost the first of this week by the time it came out. And you know what? People are starting to go, oh, what? you guys are a day late with your free programming that lasts four hours. You got to see how long it, it takes us to, to record this thing when we tickle ourselves and crack each other up and things and such. Uh, but we, it was almost this weekend, just barely. But anyway... Um, the wrestling all-stars trading cards that have been uh, just appreciating and, and exploding in value and in popularity and collectability, um, they were produced in 1982 and 1983. There were several sets, uh, three sets in all, by Pro Wrestling Illustrated, by Norman Keitzer, the gentleman that used to do the Wrestling News magazine. And, you know... All these years, we, you know, I thought because, you know, I've worked with Norman and, and, you know, I didn't think anything of him. And I've always had the sets since he sent me some originally. These have never been sold by anybody because I got them for free because my photography is involved. But at any rate, I didn't think anything of them until over a few years ago. We heard that they're considering this now the first wrestling trading card set of the modern era. And the Hulk Hogan card is considered the Hulk Hogan rookie card. And all of a sudden, when everybody heard about that, things just started going crazy. And so now, Heritage Auctions has uh, taken possession of my... I've got uh, a couple of different sets of the number one and, and full sets of the second and third one. And they have uh, taken those and they've had some of the finer cards graded. But there's something for everybody in here. They're not all professionally slabbed because I think there's might not be a high market for a Spike Huber card, possibly. I may be just going out on a limb here, but at the same time, uh, they're saying that there's some element of value to these because they came from my personal collection, especially the ones 
that my photography is featured on, like Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, Jimmy Valiant, uh, Coco Ware slash Sweet Brown Sugar, Dutch Mantel, Jimmy Hart. I'm trying to, th that's off the top of my head. There's some more. <clears throat> but anyway, um, so they're going to be auctioning these. The auction opens up October the 28th, and it runs for three weeks, and it closes on November 18th. The website is ha.com. That's for Heritage Auctions. However, in the next week or so, at jimcornett.com, we're going to have a banner up on the front page uh, with a link directly to the a specific auction that these cards will be involved in. And uh, the, uh, the, if we talked about the conditioning, Brian, remember there's like, it's a one through 10 grading system, but number five is excellent. And then like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, or whatever is like, they're the various subcategories of spotless and brilliant or whatever. So my original set, the series a set uh, according to these statistics I have here, 67% of them graded near mint to near mint mint. So you got that. We got that going for us. Exciting. Exciting. I can hear the thrill and, and the tension in your voice. Can you hear the goddamn concrete truck behind me? Is that what that is? That's what that this. The gentleman who lives <laughs> next door. <laughs> Now, what? Now, stop it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Why are you? I, I didn't say a, an insulting word. And Not just, one uh, word. The gentleman. That's what you said. <laughs> that lives next door is building a detached garage. And over the past couple of days, there have been, they've already poured the foundation. It's 25 by 55 feet. This garage that he's building apart from his 4,500 square foot home with its two car garage. Um, they poured the foundation, the concrete or whatever, and now they've been literally for the past two days, truck after truck after truck of gravel is being poured into this thing because the, 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 it's being built on a slope. So part of the foundation is higher than the other part. You see what I'm saying here? And they're filling it all in with the entire rock quarry of gravel. So that's what you're hearing. But anyway, rock quarry, rock quarry. He was a famous, a famous <laughs> manager back in the sixties, rock quarry. Anyway, so back to my cards. So the cards are going to be on auction October 28th through November 18th. As I said, there's something for everybody because not all of these are high dollar, uh, items, but if you want something from my personal collection and, uh, we're going to have Tony from heritage auctions on the experience this week to talk about he's in the sports department and they've gone, they're noticing even at heritage auctions, which I mean, this is the, they're a brand name. They're the Kleenex or the Coca-Cola or whatever of these auction houses for collectability. I mean, they've auctioned action comics, number one and million dollar items. Uh, but they're noticing the upsurge in the collectability of wrestling stuff. So We'll get some feedback on that, but that is, that's what's going to happen at Heritage Auctions. Stay tuned, and jimcornett.com will have a link to this by next week or so, and the Ole Anderson autograph card will be available at rockauto.com. <laughs> oh, my God. I, well, did Ole ever have a card? I don't remember ever seeing an Ole card. His would have probably been a, a, a platinum credit card, and he would have had the only copy of it but um i'm proud of myself also just got back from the post office where about 150 people have a copy of behind the curtain autographed by me winging its way to them via the u.s post office so between last friday and today's shipping being in it about 300 items are out another 100 are packed and ready to go tomorrow by the end of the week, we'll have another 100 out. So by the end of this week, we're going to have 500 orders filled of the, the Armageddon that we faced a few weeks ago at the opening of the new JimCornette.com. It can happen to you, folks. These orders are flying out the door now to their recipients. Am I invisible? Oh, no, you just weren't speaking. Oh. 
So flying out to the recipients and yes. the questions will be flying out to you. Yeah, it's your show. See, I was just relating some information and then I was letting you take over. The information has been relayed and now the takeover begins. <laughs> Jim, there is no takeover to speak of. However, there is an episode of Dynamite and an episode, surprisingly, the second to last episode of the season <laughs> no of Roads to the Top to review here today. Well, let's for, for just one second, let's explain that. Apparently, you have looked at the the channel guide because the not only is our schedule screwed up, but also a lot of these TV programs are changing either stations or days or times or whatever. And now you were looking to try to verify that if we unfortunately aren't going to miss any of these upcoming wrestling programs. And it says for next Saturday night's roads to the rotten immediately following Saturday night's dynamite. That's been moved from Wednesday, blah, blah, blah. It says it's the season finale. So we had two episodes air on the the debut. It was it was it was a one hour show, but apparently that was the two episodes in in terms of their season, right? Yeah, the same way Raw they, used to pretend it was two different shows for the two hours. Same. And thing. then the second week they aired two new programs, but they were clearly listed and and defined as thirty minutes each. And then the one that we just watched, unfortunately, and next, so they committed to six episodes of this. I would think they've probably taken a bath on this thing so far to begin with. What What are the number? What were the ratings after the first week? Do we have any idea? Has anybody even said? You know, let me look. Let me look that up. I have no idea. You're right. I haven't heard anything about that because. We mentioned that if, if if there was some morbid curiosity in the first week that caused people to tune in, that would quickly evaporate once they got a good strong whiff of the content of the programming. I have ratings. Well, please it, it'll enlighten us on the ratings. And let me give credit to where this came from. This apparently is from Wrestling Inc. Episodes one and two, like you said, they debuted the same night. Right after Dynamite, 422,000 viewers with a 0 0.17 rating in the 18 to 49 demographic. Episodes 3 and 4, 369,000 viewers with a 0 0.16 rating in the 18 well, now, to 49. Hold, uh, hold on one second. Does it, does it differentiate? Because that was 3 and 4, but it was... It was two different shows, so it seems like they ought to give us the ratings for the show that aired from 10 p.m. to 10.30 and then 10.30 to 11, because I can't believe it was exactly the same for both programs. Right, and we would have to get that information. I don't have it in front of me, but I would think the same thing. Well, I would think the people at Wrestling Inc. should have thought of that. I, that's the first thing I thought of, but go ahead. Episode 5, which we're going to be reviewing shortly, 340,000 viewers with a 0 0.14 rating in the 18 to 49 demographic. So obviously each episode has gone down uh, without I, knowing no, episode I gotta, four. I got to be completely honest. I cannot believe that it held up that well. What is that? Like a hundred thousand viewers between the first episode and this, the most recent one we have info on that's, I can't believe that the bottom didn't drop out like black Friday in 29. I would have imagined some of the executives at the network jumping out of their well, but I guess if all the network executives are in uh, of TNT or, or in Atlanta, they don't have high rises. So if they jumped out the third or fourth story, they'd probably just break their fucking leg. I don't think anyone's giving that much thought to roads to the top. <laughs> after, well, no, after, after I saw the first week, I'm thinking, you know, next week, it's going to be the first TV program in history to do a negative rating where some people are going to to renege on watching the first week. They're like, no, we're giving you that back. It was a negative Q rating they did. We we renounce that we saw that. But anyway, should we talk about this program since we've already done this? Should we just segue flow, if you will, into Roads to the Rotten? Let's flow right into Roads we're already, to the Rotten. We're flowing much like a a sump pump sends the sewage into a basin 
Um, I don't know what I was more uncomfortable about on this program. This is the one October 16th, by the way, the Saturday night special. I don't know whether I was most uncomfortable about the details that we were given about Brandy's uncomfortable pregnancy or again, the backstage details we were given that all wrestlers, whenever they have a match, plan everything out beforehand and immediately come back afterwards and hug each other like a bunch of goddamn kumbaya singers at summer camp. I don't know which offended me or made me more uncomfortable, squirmy, skeeved me out, as my cousin used to say. Um, the start was again all about Brandy's pregnant, not about Brandy's pregnancy in terms of, oh, I'm so happy we're going to have a girl or whatever, but no, she's uncomfortable, she's fucking huge, and she's it, it, they're showing her she's walking around. She's saying this. I'm not saying this. She's uncomfortable, and she's huge, and she's wobbling around when she's walking. She tells us that the baby is upside down, and then she relates to us how if she wrestles again and takes a big bump, she might piss herself uncontrollably because of whatever damage that this procedure is going to do or potentially might do that the doctors have said. Did we need to hear any of that on television? Brian, you just had a baby. Did, would you have said any of that on television? Well, you did not. You know what I mean. Yeah, we don't really Suzanne crave attention. Suzanne did all the work. We don't really crave attention the same way uh, the Rhodes family appears to crave attention. <sighs> so we segued from that into, into Cody's wrestling school, where the, the, the storyline of this episode is they're training Brock Anderson, and Brock's got his first match coming up, and the pressure is on Cody somehow for Brock's match not to say I would think the pressure's on Brock actually um but Cody goes to Florida for this show without Brandy they made sure to sh show him leaving and her closing the door she's still home and you know apparently since she's clocking in about 250 and can barely walk uh, Cody's oh, sister come on. and well what no what they're showing 250 saying 250 my god she was enormous i don't know not I didn't 250 see a scale oh, but yeah. anyway she's she's housebound there <laughs> home as the sick and the shut in as boyd pierce used to say that's why we're having this main event on tv today for if you all you sick and shut-ins i wonder if they cured all those diseases that the the wrestling promoters used to put main events on television once in a while for the, the sick and the shut-ins. You never hear that phrase anymore. Is no one sick and shut in? Well, now they're shut in, but they go online. So you get to hear from them. Well, and I wish they'd shut up. <laughs> so T Teal and, and Cody's mom uh, come to watch Dynamite. Sister and mother are over. It's a family Dynamite watching party. And they're they're telling a story, and you, you, I don't know if it's reality television work or it, it seems to me to be have the air of legitimacy that Teal and Brandy are not on the same page. And Teal's basically looking at her when Brandy's sitting there on the couch talking about, well, when I get back in the ring, or I don't know. And she's like, "Are you really trying to going to try to wrestle again?" And looking at her like she's got a turd hanging out of her mouth when she says this. Like most people would when you're 38 years old and you just had a baby and you were never no one, a wrestler. You were never, you were a, never wrestler. a wrestler before until <laughs> you wrestled a little while and you weren't good at it and no one's clamoring for you to do it again. So Teal shits on the idea and so did mom over and over and and there's that, you know, anxiety they've got. But meanwhile, Cody's down in Florida. Dustin is telling the the people how to work the cameras and telling the the girl opponents that the object is to go out and have fun. Have fun when you're having your match beating each other up. Yeah, that's what you say in the fucking back, but don't put it on television. God damn it. Even if the fucking business is so exposed and phony these days. Go out and have fun. 
Um, and tell him how to, how to, then afterwards he critiqued them on how to do fake shit better. And then, you know, the, the match we saw it, this was from this program was shot ages ago is Cody and Brock against QT and solo. That was back when a go, go was still around much less. Where did Comoroto go? No, uh, Comoroto's still there. A go, go has gone. A go, go gone. <laughs> a go, go gone. Comoroto stay. He should have woke me up before he a go goed. Um, but anyway, they they made sure that the people knew that that was all a complete work, and that everyone said thank you afterwards. <laughs> and uh, so then Teal gives Brandy a baby bracelet that Dusty gave her as an olive branch, as she called it. You know. And that seemed like a nice gesture on her part. And then as, as they were leaving Brandy's house, the, the la their last word was, call us if your water breaks. Oh, oh my God, I'm glad I watched this before I ate dinner. I don't want to hear that shit. I'm medical phobic. I don't want to hear any of that shit. That's why I don't watch the Discovery Surgery Channel or Dr. Pimple Popper. So when Cody comes home and hears about the family visit and she shows him the bracelet, Cody tells her about all the strings that are attached. And then they spent five minutes droning on back and forth about the meaning of the bracelet and its intended consequences, etc. This was fucking brutal. And then finally... The, the the last thing that you see before the, the big event, you know, Brian, even though she couldn't go to the show, she still has these important duties as chief brandy officer of this company. <laughs> and they actually showed her doing her makeup to get on her laptop in her house on camera on Skype and do 80s trivia night with her heels group. Remember the heels group? that they plugged for about three weeks, a safe place for women wrestling fans to, until they figured out there are no women wrestling fans anymore. $50 no, a year. Huh? $50 a year. $50 a year. Usually it's a hundred dollars for an hour, but Stop. it's $50 a year. But <laughs> Jesus, I guess there are no female wrestling fans anymore, except for the ones that are, drugged there begrudgingly by their boyfriends because there's no men in the wrestling business anymore to attract those women. But anyway, while she's doing this important work, doing trivia on the internet on Skype with her heels group, 80s trivia, 80s trivia, she starts having contractions and gets on the phone with, I guess it was the doctor, and then suddenly, boom, they show... Uh, the security footage of outside, we got to go to the hospital. It's dark outside. And then Cody's in the hospital. And then she suddenly had the baby. Oh, no, wait. Then they say she's going to have a, ces a cesarean section. C-section, which, yes. Which indicates cutting of things, from what I've heard. Yes, it would. And I don't want to know anymore. And thankfully, they didn't fill us in on any, any of that. And they have the baby, and that was like the that entire thing, and you see the baby, the whole series has been talking about pregnancy and the baby shower and the families coming together and the blah, 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 and the goddamn baby's born in like the last 90 seconds of this show. They spent five minutes talking about the baby bracelet, but the time from when they left the house and what we assume was a madcap rush to the hospital and a procedure of admittance. They should have taken a bus. What, however they got there. Maybe Adam Page picked him up on his brand new lawnmower. <laughs> but however they got that this whole procedure was not covered. And then Cody just commented, well, now we've had the baby. And then there's the baby. And, and the show's over. They have been building this and building this, and suddenly the, pfft, that would have been the great part. I love Lucy, the highest rated television program 
or uh, episode of I Love Lucy, which was one of the highest rated series of all time. And the highest rated episode of I Love Lucy was the night that little Ricky was born. And that remained, I believe it was the highest rated episode of television broadcast in America until either the last episode of The Fugitive when he caught the one-armed man or the moon landing. One or the other. And the best part of it is the fucking trip to the hospital. They didn't show their rehearsals. Can you see Cody and Brandy doing the rehearsal where they've got the suitcase by the door? I can and see, the, Yeah, I can see them rehearsing. That's the coats sure. by the door, the suitcase by the door, the car keys on the Davenport or the Schiffer robe next to the door. <laughs> the car pointed out and they go, okay. And then Brandy would say, the time has come. And then Cody would say, come here, Brandy. And they would walk no. slowly to the door. That's what they You've do in the me. rehearsal. That's what they do in the rehearsal. They pick up the bags and they get in the truck and they drive. But when it really happens, when she goes, the time has come. He's like, the time has come. And he grabs the bag and he grabs the fucking coat and he grabs the keys and he runs and he gets to the car and he pulls out of the driveway. The problem is he forgets Brandy, the pregnant woman. So he has to come back in and get her. And then he forgets all the other shit and blah, blah, blah. And then we go to the hospital and they can't find a place to park. And now she's squirted whatever that water is that breaks all over the goddamn Are you carpeting. booking this? <laughs> all over the carpeting. Of the, I guess I am. Of his floor, of his truck, and it's soaked. And there's all kinds of smegma or magma oh. or whatever they call that stuff all over the carpeting now. <laughs> You've got to fucking clean this truck. But now they get her on the gurney and they wheel her in. But somehow they run into another gurney coming down the hallway and boom and she tumbles over then they've got to fucking get somebody else to finally and finally right as they get her in the delivery room the daggum kid pops out and one of the orderlies just happens to be standing there and fair catches the kid in a goddamn bedpan now that's exciting television ladies and gentlemen See, I would do it the other way I would have it mad panic and you remember they still want to get him over as a baby face right yeah. He drives the bus. He doesn't know how to drive a bus. He doesn't have a bus driver's license. He gets behind the wheel of the bus. Brandy's in the first seat. She's screaming. He's hitting cars. He's on the highway. <laughs> he's going nuts. He pulls up. Now he's a baby face. And, 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 and when he pulls the nightmare Born express. Born to be wild. Come on, Born to be wild's playing yeah. as he's driving yeah, down the street. Yeah. <laughs> what about magic carpet ride, maybe? I like to <laughs> And he pulls the bus into the parking lot of the hospital and there's like six or seven small sports cars and, and family SUVs stuck under the undercarriage and, and out she comes on the thing. And there, yeah, but there, there needed to be more excitement on the finish of this program. But anyway. Can, I, can I ask you a question, though, that I started thinking about during this? Look, Brock Anderson shows some potential. Yes. But he also, in my eyes, shouldn't have been on TV yet. Yes. He did the Cody match. He did the Malachi match and angle. I think that's really been it that we've seen on TV. We don't know what goes yeah. on in the YouTube universe. Anthony Agogo, we never had heard of him. All of a sudden, he was elevated to this match. He had this match, and we haven't seen him since. I think he had eye surgery. So he's not there. And you got to think if he was going to have eye surgery, unless it was an emergency thing, they knew in advance something was coming up. He would have to go to England to have surgery. Well, and, 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 but fleshing that out, even because he, he's blind in one eye from what I hear. And he's got a, a, an issue where he doesn't want to lose the sight in the other eye. And so that takes precedent over a lot of shit. But why wouldn't you do a piece on that on television to explain it? You don't have to fucking crusade for six months as, oh, poor Anthony every week and go fund me or whatever, but just let people know and maybe have some update on the procedure on one of your athletes. But go ahead. Well, that ties into my question. Again, not to take anything away from both guys' future and both guys' potential, but they were both rushed into something on TV and then they were gone or, you know, not used much like Brock Anderson. Was that all for the reality show? I don't know. It it actually, it was a whole lot better uh, part of the wrestling show than it was the reality show. I just think that they just used Brock too soon. In in the thing with 
Cody and Malachi Black, it fit because of Arn and because of the other of Cody's minions right. that were yeah. affected. That that fit. But at the same time, they 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 had debuted Brock in this particular match, that match with, you know, QT and et cetera, that was rushing it. Um, because there's no way he should have had his debut match on national television because a lot of people formed a, an opinion of him that might be hard to, to, you know, change later on. That's why OVW was valuable. That's why the territories were valuable. That's why small places where you could work three or four days a week, at least even, you know, 15 years ago, places like Burt Prentice would run that didn't get a lot of attention. Most people didn't know they were there. That's the best place for Brock Anderson. That's be the best place for six months or so for Rex Steiner, just so that they're not seen for the first time on national television. But no, I, I think it, it fit into that program and the reality show was being done at the same time. But I just, I, it's not fair to some of these guys. I mean, Rex Steiner obviously will recover from anything because he's the closest thing I've seen to, you know, a bulletproof prospect. I don't care what kind of fucking goofy gimmick they give him or goofy name or whatever, just for him to have that magnetism and athletic ability and look and size and voice at this point, he'll, he'll figure out how to work. His dad did. But Brock does not have all of those attributes. He's like Arn, the, the program, the program, the promo that Arn cut one time. I parlayed average talent, average ability, and average looks with, I think, however he said, above average determination into the spot I've got. You know, because Arn was, was a natural, but not in terms of a bodybuilder or a giant or a, you know, and it, it, I saw, God, how old is Brock Anderson right now? Because I met Arn in 1983. I would assume he was in his mid twenties at that point. He's 24. Okay. I met Arn when Arn was the same age as Brock is now. And Arn at that point, looked pretty much like the Arn Anderson everybody remembers from the Four Horsemen. Because it not only was he physically that large, give or take a pound or two, but his work was pretty close to what it was because he'd had a year or two of being Marty Lundy and working Mid-South, the College of Wrestling Knowledge, and doing all those things and nobody ever fucking saw him. Arn, the first match that Arn Anderson had, which was some debacle in, in or near Rome, Georgia, and also involving Ted Allen, uh, later to become Nightmare Ted Allen, later to become Smoky Mountain ring truck guy, et cetera, et cetera, good old Ted Allen. Arn, actually, he was going bald when he was in his early 20s. He wore a toupee in his first match in some indie show somewhere, and I think it either fell off or started flapping. And and that was the end of that. But that's the problem is Brock has had nowhere to go like that. You know, when when you've been able to, when your first year in the business, you go and work seven nights a week for fucking Bill Watts and just sit in the locker room with the talent that he had then, that's better than going to wrestling school for two years. So it just, you know... It, it's not fair to some of these guys now that they're just popping up on national TV or that they that something they do in a barn somewhere because of the internet can be seen all over the world if people are interested. And that, you know, that doesn't do anybody any favors either. We said a couple of weeks ago, and I'll finish this thought up, but we said a few, few, few weeks ago, and I can't remember how it came up, but there is no great undiscovered talent like a tiger mask in the wrestling business anymore where you can see him for the first time ever and go holy fucking shit because anybody worth anything can be seen by anybody from anywhere now because of the internet so you can't 
you can't be an undiscovered sensation anymore. Well, Jim, certainly after watching Roads to the Top, some of the listeners may feel like drinking. And you may not just want the typical hooch. You may not want something you get down at the liquor store. You may want something a little more classy. You may want to class it up Game of Thrones style after watching Roads to the Top and enjoy a nice glass of wine. Well, Brian, if you want to have a tasty beverage, a cocktail, a, a glass of wine, then I suggest that you get on the good side of the folks at WSJ Wine from the Wall Street Journal. We just got a big box delivered to the castle here of some of the fine wines that they've picked out. And folks, you will want to as well. Going into the holidays, WSJ Wine is your key to holiday prep. If you've got a dinner party to attend, you need a hostess gift. With WSJ Wine, you are never empty-handed or empty-stomached. WSJ Wine from the Wall Street Journal is the best way to find your new favorite wines from all over the globe. And the holidays are a perfect time to reconnect, reminisce, and indulge. Even overindulge. As a matter of fact, get positively soused. But, most importantly, <laughs> the holidays are a celebration of togetherness. Even if you hate people, you want to be together with them at the holidays. With WSJ Wine at the center of it all, this holiday season promises one joyful discovery after another. You'll find out things about people in your family you never knew after no, four no, no, no. bottles of wine. The discovery is about the wine, not the, the secrets discovery from the of the family. wine, yes. yes. And then the things that the wine brings out well, about, you know, that time at summer camp and, and, and who what? really took that money out of dad's. But, but anyway. Folks, the WSJ Wine Discovery Club brings award-winning wines right to your doorstep. Get direct access to these small batch handcrafted wines you need to try this holiday season. This is not mass manufactured stuff. This is fine artisan crafted small batches. Some of these people just make a a, a bottle or two in their in their bathroom. It's very no. limited, so you get the finest quality. It's professional. Folks, yes, very professional. It's a, a, a plumber installed the bathtub. Anyway, <laughs> no. WSJ Wine presents the Holiday Top 12, the most wonderful wines of the year. Uncork them all and save $125. WSJ Wine tastes over 40,000 wines each year and selects less than 1% of them, many of which are award winners. Just so like Brzezinski. Yes, these th Dave Brzezinski, Supermouth himself. He is a, a wine connoisseur and expert. I met him in a sewer, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Folks, at WSJ Wine, you can rate your wines and refine your selections. Tell them what you like and what you didn't. Even speak to a personal wine advisor so they can customize your next case of wine. And there's a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't love a wine for any reason, you'll get a refund. And you can receive a new dozen from WSJ Wine's most talented winemakers every three months. At about one bottle a week, you can enjoy at your own pace. Or if you go with the two or three bottles a day, like if you were living in Connecticut and working for Vince McMahon, then you can go through a case in about four days. Anyway, <laughs> members save at least 20% on every case they choose to take while earning exclusive rewards and VIP upgrades. There's no ob obligation to continue. The WSJ Wine Discovery Club offers the flexibility to delay delivery, skip a case, or cancel any time. But why would you want to do that when you can get drunk off your ass? Folks, <laughs> now try the WSJ Wine Holiday Top 12, plus enjoy two bonus bottles and two wine glasses for $69.99 plus tax and shipping. Holy shit, I can't even do the math, but that turns out to, it's the same price as a two liter of Sprite Zero for this fine wine. You just, you got to text Jim, J-I-M, to 64,000 to get that special offer. Text Jim to 64,000 at six, four and three zeros. Some people still ask about this. 64,000, six, four, zero, zero, zero. Text Jim to 64,000 and... The Holiday Top 12, two bonus bottles and two wine glasses for $69.99 plus tax and shipping. Holy boy, howdy, how in the world do we do that? Ask for the Dixie special and you get four bottles and sued by Billy Corgan. Well, if, if you ask for the Dixie Holiday special, 
you get eight <laughs> bottles sued by Billy Corgan yes. and end up with Kevin Nash on your lap. Folks, turn on her on. lap. Well, <laughs> he's on her lap, really. Terms apply. <laughs> Available at <laughs> wsjwine.com slash terms. <laughs> or <laughs> terms available at Nash's on Dixie's lap.com. I don't know. Well, someone just gobbled up that website, but Jim, on the topic of wrestling and gobbling things up, AEW gobbled up another couple of hours with AEW Dynamite this week, Saturday night, the second of two nights back to back in Miami. Yes, they did. They did indeedly doodly do that, didn't they? Indeedly doodly, they did the. Yes. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, sometimes it's more important the things that they don't do than when they do do. But in this case, what they did was not do do. I hate for them. I feel bad for them as an old time promoter or wrestling promoter. I feel bad that they did one of their better television programs when they're off night and off time and et cetera. And, and obviously the ratings will be off to reflect that because They've had some real stinkers on their Wednesday night regular slot. And then with a couple of exceptions that we will talk about, they did another good show. So we will, I mean, a lot of it may be accidental and some of it may be who they feature on the program and who they don't, but there wasn't a, there wasn't a ton embarrassing. I, I didn't feel bad for him when it was over with on this one. Were you surprised for both nights with how hot the Miami crowd was? No. Especially for Punk. They were going nuts for Punk both nights. Well, that's the thing. I, I was not surprised. I'm never surprised by how hot their crowd is, except I'm surprised sometimes by how hot they aren't, but not really surprised because five-hour tapings wear the people out. But we, by the same token that I knew that Miami was not going to draw, you know, 10 or 12,000 people because Miami never has for anybody. Um, the people that are going to be there are still going to, they're the ones that most want to be there. And if you notice, AEW crowds are always hot, except as I said, when they've been burnt out by five hour tapings, they started hot. It just it it doesn't make any difference as to how many of them there are that because the ones that are there, even if it's a smaller group, they're the ones that want to be there the most. And if, if it all, always used to be conventional wisdom, even before the modern era, when it's WWF's in a stadium or whatever, the bigger building you were in and the bigger crowds you had, the more casual fans you got, the more casual fans you got really the in a lot of cases the quieter the crowd was until you got to the main events because a lot of those people hadn't been to live wrestling in that town in a year or a couple of years or however long and they didn't know the underneath guys they came because of the main event the people who come every week they knew everybody they react to everything the people who only come because of the main event or some angle or something that's trip their trigger and tickle their fancy they're not going to be into as much of the underneath stuff as the regulars because they just they hadn't been in a year or two but boy they wanted to see whatever right but anyway having said that they start out the program pyro jim ross's voice They've got fans there. They're in the night center. They're in a, a good sized building. It looks professional. And all of a sudden, like Mussolini and oh. WC Fields. Here we go. The entrance. And he comes out and he goes around the ring while the announcers are billboarding the show. It keeps the energy up. Instead of doing that whole billboard beforehand, and then here comes Punk, they get him out there. They're playing the music. You've got a recognized, well-known commercial piece of music. You've got a mainstream superstar. You've got people really happy to see him. And now you've got your announcers led by the voice of wrestling for the past 30 years telling people what they're going to see. And as they're panning the crowd, there were children. Did you notice that? 
I did not notice, but I'm not surprised, but I did not notice. There were children. You don't usually see that at wrestling these days. Even at AEW uh, shows, there were an inordinate amount of children on camera. Young, younger, like less than 12 children. So maybe something's going on down there in Miami. But anyway. I will say with Punk on commentary, and I've, I've talked before how much I enjoy him on commentary. He reminds me of what I love about baseball commentators. And it may sound foreign to you, but it's a lot of what I like about Lance Russell when he's not screaming or there's not something action packed <laughs> happening. It's the ability to have a conversation, still yes. keep up with what's happening, say witty things, say intelligent things, but not just be screaming at me and certainly not screaming buzzwords at me over and over. And it always reminds me of why I love baseball. While even if I'm not watching every moment of the game, I'll have it on so I can hear the commentators because they don't offend me and I like it. Punk does commentary the same way. It hit me watching this. Well, he's conversational and he sounds genuine and he brings up... <sighs> there was... I, I made note of it. I've got my notes here. I don't know what it was uh, right off the top of my head, but he brought up a good point to reinforce something. He... He thinks about it like he thinks about wrestling logically and 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 he's not he's he's articulate enough to skirt the the line between coming out and saying something is obviously a work and uh, offending someone that way or he doesn't he's not going to come out and say that shit's a work in so many words, but he's not going to come out and say that shit's a shoot in so many words, but he approaches it like it's legitimate. Does that make any sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I think every time he's been on commentary, he's lifted the whole commentating team. But anyway, so they've got him at the, at the, uh, at the desk. And as soon as that happens, boom, they hit the blackout. And then here comes Malachi black. And again, whether you've seen this guy or not, whether you have watched this program or not, for a new viewer who's watched wrestling in the past but doesn't know anything about this program or whatever, you would want to sit and wait, well, who the fuck is this and what is he going to do? It's He's got an aura. There's a spookiness to the entrance. It's kind of intriguing. He's obviously somebody. It's not some outlaw-looking look goof coming down the aisleway. It's not pockets. It's not jelly. It's a somebody that you would stop and pay attention to if you weren't familiar with who they were and not in a, a way to point and laugh at them like the other two I just mentioned, but this might be a major league deal. Here's something that I thought of, and I don't know why anybody else hasn't said this. Have you heard anybody talk about this? You know, Alex, Al Alistair Black, <laughs> Malachi Black, who am I? The Alistair Black. That was his old Alistair. name. Okay, um, Malachi Black blew the mist last week on the program or whatever, what they replayed it, right? The black mist in the face that he blew like Muda, like Kabuki, right? Right. You're doing the same thing everybody else has. Yeah, he, he blew the mist on him. Go to the mall. And find somebody and say, hey, did you ever see when so-and-so blew the mist on somebody? They, what the fuck are you talking about? It's been over 40, and people say I'm stuck in the past. It's been over 40 years since Kabuki blew the mist. The red mist, the green mist, all the shit's on now, brother. It's been over 30 years since Muda blew the mist in WCW. So why are the, all the announcers just referring? Well, he blew the black mist. Like this is the thing that everybody does. Like it's a normal thing without try. If, if this was a legitimate undertaking, wouldn't you, even if you didn't know how he did it or why he did it or what it was, wouldn't you try to explain it? What could that be? How could he have done it? Who taught him how to do that? What's the backstory of this? It appeared to blind the man, but what kind of caustic substance can this be? Even Jim Ross is involved in this, and he is violating Bill Watts is one of his standard rules and the memo that I still have to this day that Bill Watts gave us. Gentlemen, I know you're all superstars. And this was all in, in quotation marks. Superstars, quotation marks. And the people, quotation marks, 
know everything, quotation marks. But, and he was telling the guys, when you're doing a gimmick match and doing promos for it, explain the gimmick, explain the rules, explain the stipulations. Don't assume everyone knows. Don't assume everyone knows why you're mad at this guy. Tell him in your promo. Don't assume everyone knows everything. Give them the information they need to know. So since it's been 30 and 40 years, since on a mainstream basis in the wrestling business, a wrestler has made a habit of blowing a colored mist from his mouth into somebody else's face, wouldn't it be an idea if we tried to fucking dig deeper and find out how he's doing it, why he's doing it, what it consists of? Talk to the people it's, ha it's happened to. Oh my God, it burned. I couldn't see. It was like pepper spray. Or have him searched beforehand to see if he's got this shit contained on him. And after he's searched by two referees, he has a match and he blows it anyway. Oh, how the fuck did he do that? You see what I'm saying? There, there can be, it's, they're just, oh, look, he blew the mist. Oh, look, he had projectile diarrhea and Dante Martin caught it in his mouth. You're it doesn't right. make sense if you don't question this. You're right. They should have done some kind of package to establish what it is. I hadn't even thought of it that way just because I know what it is, but that's from when I was nine years old. Yes. And because we are wrestling savants and know everybody. But again, Bill Watts warned 40 years ago, warned us of this. Don't assume the people know everything. And even if they do know Kabuki and Muda did it, why wouldn't they continue to go into this type of detail and make something out of it? Anyway, so Malachi Black wrestled Dante Martin. And Dante Martin was accompanied by our friend Leo LBO Rush, who is obviously trying to insinuate himself into Dante Martin's life and career and existence for at some point for there to be some kind of conflict. And I'm sure this is one of their long-term things. And well, meanwhile, well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, besides the fact that it's not a giant like Lashley and the fact that Leo Rush will be wrestling, isn't this kind of how you thought he should be used as a manager who could get a lot of heat for guys? Again, it's not a monster like Lashley, but what are the similarities? What are the differences with how you would use him? Well, Dante Martin is a young baby face that Leo Rush is already painting the picture that it, they're, they're already doing this with Hardy. He's going to fucking get Dante Martin in shit that Dante Martin doesn't necessarily need to be in. He's going to be hanging out in the wrong crowd. Leo's going to be taking advantage of him. Leo's a quick talker. Leo's pushed him into things. Leo's announced he's his new tag team partner. Dante Martin doesn't know any that Dante Martin's a great young baby face. Um, I'm not knocking Dante Martin. I'm just saying that this is, I don't, <sighs> you're taking a guy who obviously is a Leo Rush, a heel, I don't know if he's a heel at heart, but he's a natural heel, he's a loudmouth little wise guy, and he's going to insinuate himself into Dante's life and start calling shots in some respect while Dante's brother is off with the injury, but at some point, Unless they're going to try to turn Dante Martin heel, which would be stupid, because the best part about him is his flashy flying and his young innocence. So they're setting up another fucking manager takes advantage of his pupil deal, I would assume, which is what they're doing over with the Hardys. And Dante Martin is just getting established. So now you've got a distracting side story of what's going to happen with his you know, loud-mouthed, possibly shady manager rather than the attention should have been on this fantastic fucking match they had. This was one of the best TV matches that they've had on this program. From the start of it, Malachi Black, did he did two of the best arm drags that I've ever seen in a, in a wrestling ring from anybody, even Steamboat, and got applause for him. And Dante Martin should have shared in that applause because he took them perfect. Because that's the art, too. This was easily Malachi Black's best performance in the ring since he's been there. It was even Malachi Malik's best performance there, too. Even both of them. <laughs> um, no, and that's the thing. Dante Martin got to do some shit, but Malachi Black kept in control. He's the bigger guy. He was aggressive. He was vicious. He was quick. 
He did some weird, different type, that weird leg shit that he did. Dante Martin had to fight for everything because he's a younger kid and you want to feel sorry for him because he's got that innocent face. You know, as they used to say, the white meat baby face. Finally, you know, Dante fights for shit. And finally, when he hit that flip dive onto Malachi and they had a ramp rather than, you know, so you could dive over the top and onto the ramp, it was level with the apron. So he hits in that and threw him back in the ring like he was going to try to beat him. Imagine that. That's unheard of. They should Normally they stay outside on the floor for 10 minutes, but he hits him with his dive. He throws him back in, goes for a springboard, but misses it. They trade. Martin hits an enzigiri and fucking Malachi Black. That, the they call it a meteora. And I've seen a few people do that now. And I don't know how a guy that size does that move as well as he did in this instance, especially to Dante Martin, without either killing the guy you're doing it to or tearing both your PCL ligaments in your knees when you land. It got a real nice uh, pop on the false finish. He hit the Meteora, a kick, and a German, and got a two count. And then they, you know, Dante Martin hit that Hurricane Rana off the top, which is a little dodgy, but they both sold it. Um, and then Dante Martin did the springboard double jump moonsault that he was going for before that he missed, and he was supposed to hit this one. Well, he almost missed it, but Malachi Black Gunna got underneath him just in the nick of time, so we'll give him that one. Um, but, it, you know, he's trying stuff with a high degree of difficulty. I This match was so good back and forth, I can, I can forgive a few bobbles. Uh, but then finally, help me on the finish. Because... Malachi Black finally gets a, a single-legged Boston Crab on him, and he's cranking back on it, but it looked like he either started choking, coughing, was he selling something that he was dizzy or whatever, but he let go of it, and the announcers were questioning, why did he do that? And, and I, didn't, uh, I, I didn't catch it either. I didn't get what the cause was of that. What was going on there? Well, if the announcers are questioning it, what do I know? Well, I mean, did you have any? I have no idea. Feeling of that? No. It was it was a little strange. Whatever, but maybe the uh, whatever was in his stomach for the mist. It was you know sometimes it works, sometimes it makes you sick. I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, Martin finally missed a jump, and Malachi Black hit that fucking kick. Boom! One, two, three, and the people cheered like crazy because Gordon Black is getting over as a baby face, especially after he kicked shit out of Cody. And that's the problem you're going to have with this crowd that's all over smart. Any heel that's any good, they're going to cheer him too, but... Um, yeah, to be realistic about Malachi Black, I, I agree with you to a point, but they brought him in and put him up against a babyface who's only a babyface because he's forcing himself to be a babyface because the people aren't reacting to him that way. So he's course, a bino. So of, <laughs> so of course they're going to cheer Malachi. If Malachi was up against one of the top baby fa like whether he's a heel or a babyface, someone who the fans treat like a babyface, then maybe they'd boo him. But the whole Cody thing set him up to be a babyface. Well, I don't. But this gimmick for that crowd, um, I mean, you know, MJF tells them some horrible truths about themselves, <laughs> so I can see him having heat. But a guy with a spooky gimmick and looks good, his shit looks good and everything, is going to they're going to have a hard time getting heat on any heel in that environment because everybody's too smart for their own good. But anyway, it was a really good match. This was the way to open a fucking show and commercial free. So I, I have to, uh, again, hold on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. They had some wrestling on the program. And you, you know, some people are losing their fucking rabid ass minds. Cornette's on Tony Khan's payroll now. He's accepting a check. He'll be there any moment. Because after two years, they finally have like six good fucking matches. And uh, my God, before it was, oh, Cornette wouldn't say anything about him even if they were any good. And so now every once in a while, a blind squirrel finds a nut and they do something good, and I, oh, Cornette's on the payroll. Tony Khan can't afford me. He's only got $8 billion. I got shit to do.
You know, Malachi it, has been really good. It was a great opening match, and we've talked a lot about him. I hate the fact that he's going to have to do a job to Cody because it seems like that's what's being set up. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Dante Martin. I have a question that was sent in. I was probably going to ask you later on about the four pillars of AEW. I'll save it for later. But it makes me wonder what his future is because everything they've done with him, he's been used right. He looks good. He's doing flashy stuff that people pop for. He seems like a natural baby face, probably even better than Pillman Jr. Because Pillman Jr., it's a little over the top, the baby face-ish. This guy just seems like a real guy. And by the way, where is Brian? <laughs> I don't he know. I'm uh, taking care of Griff, if I had to guess. Well, but it, it, here's just here's another thing. Uh, Tony, jot this down, if you would, in your notebook. Just don't hold it toward the camera next time you place <laughs> for a picture. <laughs> when you have a match between a heel and a, and a baby face, and it's a younger baby face where you want to put him in with a top heel, but at the same time that he's not going to get the last word on the heel. He's going to do the job in the end and the heel's going to go off for bigger and better things. One of the things that you do in conjunction with that is immediately bring the young baby face back the next week on TV and give him a nice win after he lost to the other guy, because that doesn't leave then the impression in people's minds that so-and-so is a loser. But they missed that part of it. But anyway. what I was going to say is with Dante Martin, I think they have something special here. And with some guys, you have to wait until they have more seasoning. He may be one of these guys you kind of want to jump on and do as much as you can with while he's young because he's incredibly talented. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Don't say, yeah, jump on and do as much as you can before he cripples himself doing one of these fucking springboard things lands on his head. No. Um, they don't want to jump on him and do everything they possibly can right now. They want to protect him and they want to do the right things with him. A book and wrestling is kind of like the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. If you've got a guy that's a young guy that's that's got a lot of potential and you want to plan for the future, don't pour everything on him right. And let's face it, Dante is still very green. Uh, old Malachi Black has some experience, and he's not bad. And he led some of this. If you've got a different kind of guy laying the match out, then Dante's green shines through better than in other instances. So, so you want to bring the guy along, show the people what he can do, let the people like him, but not just start, okay, now we're just going to immediately put him in main events. Take your time. He's 20, whatever the fuck years old, 20, 21, 22, whatever. If he can do this shit now, just don't have him doing it every goddamn, you know, backyard bar mitzvah and garden party across America. Just do it when it counts, save the bumps on his bump card, and let his experience smooth out his transitions and the rest of the, the game he's got. And I got to be honest, I know we've heard him talk a couple of times. Do you remember what he sounds like? I don't remember what he sounds like, but I also remember that it wasn't bad. But that's the point I'm making is. It may not be bad, but do you remember what he sounded like? No, nobody else really does either. Let him get a little older. Take a little bit more time. Just don't immediately boom. And I mean, I'm not saying they're going to do this, but to your question, don't just immediately say, oh, shit, we got to get what we can get while we can. Calm That's not exactly how I put it. but Well, but it kind of is a lot of guys would do that or a lot of people would try to do that. You know, well, shit, this guy ain't going to last forever the way he's doing. So we got to do it. Now. No, just slow him down a little bit and slow everything down in a nice pace. He's got plenty of time. But speaking of plenty of time, at least now the stuff that, or at least on this program, the stuff that really sucked is limited mostly to the backstage area. Because Tony Schiavone is in the back with Jungle Boy and Dino Douche, right? And Jungle Boy has to speak. Remember, he said that he doesn't like that too much. But he starts and he. He says his shit kind of blandly with no emotion, but at least he got it out. And then he mocked the, remember the power bomb that 
the elite screwed up on Dino Douche where they were trying to show that three of them had to help Twinkle Toes lift him up to powerbomb him, and when they did, they all fell over because Twinkle Toes didn't get under him. So Jungle Boy's smart-ass statement is, what I'm really glad that that uh, Luchasaurus is okay after that devastating power bomb, and I swear to Jesus Christ on a cracker is who I swear to. It was not a second after the word power bomb was spoken. There wasn't even a beat. There wasn't a space in between the words. Twinkle Toes interrupts from just off camera, eight feet away in front of Jungle Boy. Like that it's a big surprise he's there. And he takes offense to his power bomb effort being chastised. He was standing right there. How else would you know? It it wasn't like Jungle Boy went on for 30 or 45 seconds about, yeah, the crummy power bomb. A fucking Harpo Marks looking asshole. Couldn't, <laughs> couldn't pick Luchasaurus up. He folded like a cheap suit. What And then the guy comes in. It was literally as soon as he got the word powerbomb out of his mouth, the guy from one foot off the camera, eight feet away in front of Jungle Boy, suddenly it's a surprise. Oh, what are you doing here? And then all of the elite and their theme song, beat your meat, beat, beat your meat. They jump on the baby faces here and they watch, they have, Poor Adam Cole. Poor Adam Cole, who has really a boy, he's taken a first class trip from the penthouse to the outhouse over the past few weeks. They make Jungle Boy watch while Twinkle Toes and the rest of them power bomb Dino Douche through a table that's sitting there, because of course, why wouldn't it be? While the Hardly Boys make funny faces for the camera. So again, they have some good talent in the ring, working hard. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to be around Malachi Black's fucking right foot because those kicks look, some of them look really good and some of them look really stiff. But these guys were out there working their asses off to get over in the ring. And then these jack offs set up something that's not only obviously phony and fake on the face of it but then is uh, pays pays off by making the baby faces look like complete idiots. So your thoughts? Not a fan of it. Think the young bucks are stupid. This is usually the childish segment of the show and I'm ready to move on. Good. Because now we go back to the ring <clears throat> and again, the, you know, the crowd helped this next segment. The crowd really did help this next segment because it got confusing, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But the dinner circle is reunited. The whole dinner circle, Jericho and Jake Hager and Sammy Guevara and Santana and Ortiz, they come to the ring to do a live interview. And by the way, have you noticed Ortiz looks much better and more professional? He's got a new hairdo. He's got a new look he's dressing. He doesn't... And we fondly called him Pampiro Fer Furpo Jr. Uh, not that Pampiro Furpo did not have a, a great look, but Ortiz looks better. And Santana started talking, and I, I was I was just starting to write. Santana did a really good promo when he, but he had just really started it, and he was doing good when America's Top Team interrupted, and. This is their home area. I don't know if they're right in Miami, but they're in South Florida. So the people know Dan Lambert personally, apparently, because they hated him. No, <laughs> but they booed the shit out of Dan Lambert. And Jericho, of course, got to people chanting fat face dipshit. And I know that we have now, after the South Park episode, established that you can just say shit over and over on basic cable repeatedly, right? The problem is I didn't have a problem with this interview and them saying fat face dipshit, etc. until I saw the rest of the program and realized that the most important 
interview that one of their top baby faces has ever done in his career was centered on the word shit later on in the program and Jericho went out and shit all over it. Yeah, and by the way, fat face dipshit, that's the pot calling the kettle a pot. No, actually, that would be the pot calling a kettle a kettle, wouldn't it? Because, well, nevertheless, they're both fat face dipshit. Well, actually, Dan's got a fat face, but he's not a dipshit. Jericho's got the fucking grand slam. But the point is, Chris Jericho was more worried about getting feedback for his segment and than not shitting on, literally shitting on Adam Page's shit. Anyway, I did like that Jericho said to Paige Van Zandt, who looks hotter than a $2 pistol, as my old friend the Dream Machine would say. Uh, he told her, I wouldn't touch you with your husband's genitalia, which is the clean version of what everybody in the locker room used to say 30 years ago, which was, I wouldn't fuck her with your dick. But anyway. Which was no surprise to the guys in the Smoky Mountain locker room. And, and there he, <laughs> he wouldn't fuck anybody with his own dick. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I remember one night, I think it was Casey O'Connor told me, he said, yeah, I said, Jericho had a, a girl in his room all night. And then when she came back down the stairs the next morning, he said, well, how was it? And she said, all he wanted to do was stay up all night and talk. Anyway, <laughs> um, when... When Jericho said to Paige Van Zandt, I wouldn't touch you with your husband's genitalia, that's when Punk said, I don't believe him. I think he would. <laughs> anyway, the thing is, Jericho challenges America's top team for a 10-man tag team match. Okay, and I figured that's probably where they were going in some respect. But then you watch this. Help me. Lambert... And I'm try. I, it confused me. I don't know whether he lost part of his explanation because the people were on him. I don't know whether it just wasn't said. It was said, and I didn't understand it. Lambert declined a ten man, said some other confusing stuff, and said that he would tell us his terms next week. But then Sammy Guevara responded to that by saying he'd kick all of their asses next week. But we hadn't heard the terms, and how is that? What happened here? Well, like most Jericho things, we need an extra week of garbage. Like, you know, the terms, or the debate, or this, or that. I mean, it doesn't Parley. surprise me there. Parley! That's right. They're very good. Good memory. If you Par remember Parley than Bear. I do. Parley Bear. Classic television character actor. He played the mayor of Mayberry on Andy Griffith uh, on a regular basis. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on here. I have not liked any of this. I don't like Dan Lambert stuff, and I know people do, but to me, it sounds like a guy doing, like, spoken word of song lyrics. Like, he knows what he's going to say, and he's just spitting them out, no matter what the reaction is by the fans or whatever's in the ring. And I don't like that style. We, we talked about he needs some inflection, and he needs to slow down and mean it rather than reciting it. I will say, out of all of the people involved in this, including Junior Dos Santos, who's been exposed, Oh, boy. Paige Van Zant is a fucking wrestling star. Forget about an <laughs> MMA star. And I don't know if it's as a valet, and I hate to use that term for anyone that offends, but that sort of role, or if you train her to actually wrestle, which who knows if that's something she would want to do. She seems to be having a great fucking time, and she's a natural, and she's great in this. She's the breakout star of this whole fucking feud. Sammy, you know, they're trying to elevate. And I agree with you about Ortiz. I think Ortiz in the last year and a half got into better shape, stopped acting like a clown, stopped sticking at his tongue, and now he seems more legit. You might see a guy like that in front of Don Pedro in Brooklyn. You might not see the guy sticking at his tongue walking around the streets. I mean, it's two different kind of people. <laughs> Wait a minute. I've been in New York a bunch, and I've seen a lot of people wandering around sticking their tongue out. And the idea of a 10-man... Usually they're having a conversation with themselves. And the 10-man tag thing... I'm kind of over that. I'm not looking forward to that. I don't know if we're going to get that. That's what I'm saying. I didn't understand what what the bottom line came out of this was. There's no... <laughs> I'm not going to say it out loud. I'll say it out loud. The terms of the 10-man tag, there's no way this will be like a war games, right? There's no way they would do that for this. So Jericho could get his war games win back. There's no way they would do that already, right? Ah... Uh, uh. We shall see. Oh, my God, there's a chance. Well, Jim, 
Some people may think about that chance and want to talk to somebody. And of course, listeners of the show know there's always someone there to talk to. These are the segues you're giving me now to, you know, <laughs> God damn it. Just because I'm the only podcaster in the world that actually puts clips of the ads up on YouTube because people would rather listen to those than the programming doesn't mean I'm Merlin the Magician. But I'll tell you one thing that can work magic on your personal life, and that is our friends at BetterHelp. And as a matter of fact, Brian, I have an email from one of the listeners um, who says, Hello, Jim, and I guess Brian. Uh, I won't give his name, but my name is such and such, and I'm a maintenance mechanic at a hospital in upstate New York. I also work nights. As you probably know, working in a hospital through the pandemic has been very challenging compounding the issue i mismanaged my stress and anxiety leading to some legal problems parentheses dui that are still ongoing i'm writing to thank you and brian for partnering with BetterHelp. because last march after having severe depression resulting in suicidal thoughts i signed up and have been seeing a therapist weekly since then and the difference this has made in my life has been amazing i'm much better at handling my stress and anxiety in day-to-day -day life as well as dealing with the uncertainty of my legal situation. And this gentleman wanted to thank us for, for the reference. And that's what we have, have heard from a variety of the listeners, folks. If you've had an issue, regardless of what it is, through the pandemic or the isolation or the quarantine or et cetera, you might need to just dump all this on somebody and, and let them hear it. And better help is the way that you can communicate with somebody it's uh, over the internet. It's not in person, but it's worldwide. You can schedule the weekly video or phone sessions, so there's no waiting rooms. There's no trips from your house, and you can get timely and thoughtful responses because you can log into your account anytime and send messages to your counselor. There's a broad range of expertise available, and the service, as we mentioned, is available worldwide. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. So. You can visit their website. You can read the testimonials that they post daily. And you can go to BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, BetterHelp.com slash drive, and you'll get 10% off your first month's services. BetterHelp.com slash drive. A special offer for our listeners, 10% off your first month's services. It may just be a simple thing as needing somebody to talk to. So. You can join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional with our friends at BetterHelp. Well, Jim, going back to Dynamite, although the Malachi Black-Dante Martin match was great, I think my favorite thing was up next. Well, yes, and I must admit that I didn't see this coming because they set it up on a previous show, but it was Andre Ole Olio. And, and and whoever was with him and the Lucha Brothers, and I didn't understand, and I never ha have one single word in English or Spanish that Andre has ever said, so therefore, I didn't know this was coming, but they did the old tag team under the mask switcheroo deal with the heels. Uh, it, it works with baby faces or heels. Remember, the Midnight did that with on Mid-South Television with the Rock and Roll Express when supposedly we were meeting Mr. Wrestling 1 and 2. And when they come in, they don't like, what the fuck? And they throw the robes on. It's the Rock and Roll Express. Oh, shit. Because you had a list of opponents. You said you would wrestle three times, I think, on TV, and you had yes. a list of opponents. And, of course, the good teams were all off the lists. Yeah, well, we'd already beaten all of them. So we <laughs> fought, like, you know, George Weingroff and John King and so-and-so and such-and-such, and, such and, such, and Tits McGee may have been in there, and then came Mr. Wrestling 1 and 2. Well, in this case, it was FTR led to the ring in these green outfits, La Super Ranas. Did they, did they say that means frogs? The Super know. Frogs? Or I don't know. What the fuck? But anyway, but here's the thing. I... <sighs> I don't know what, maybe they didn't clue the announcers in on what they were going for, the point of this, because Punk had to be the one to out FTR, but say, guys, this is clearly FTR. And, he, and Tony Schiavone was kind of like, well, we don't know for sure, or something like that. <laughs> is that what you were hearing? 
It was weird. Like they, yeah. They would have all been on the same page as this because it was obviously FTR in green outfits. Because right around the point in time where I was thinking to myself, is it supposed to be obvious that it's FTR? Yeah. CM Punk said it's obviously FTR, but then yeah. still Excalibur and the boys were still pretending like they didn't know what was going on. Yeah, Punk was getting blowback for having the power of fucking vision. I don't <laughs> you know. But in, and and the this match was for the AAA tag team title because the the Mexican company for those not familiar because the Lucha Brothers are not only the AEW champions but the AAA champions so the AAA belts were on the line here and those belts look like license plates uh, compared to the AEW belts but anyway um, they actually started wrestling. FTR are magicians. They can get something out of anybody. And in the first segment, they had some wrestling, and then they went for one of the Lucha Brothers masks, and they turned the tables, and they popped FTR's hoods uh, right for the break spot. They popped both the hoods at the same time. So that probably made them feel a lot better because if, the, if you're not used to wrestling in a mask, it's miserable. Anyway, they come back from the break, and... FTR have been in charge apparently during the commercial break, but immediately Penthouse on the other side of the break comes back and they did a heck of a spot. I will go for this. It doesn't have to be constant. It doesn't have to be repetitious. It doesn't have to be completely without logic, but a nice fucking move like what they did, the flying gymnastics. Felix runs down the ramp penthouse stands there and vaults him up on over his head onto the top rope and he comes off with a missile drop kick one foot to both members of ftr that was a great spot it worked out nobody fell on their ass it didn't look phony and it got a big pop then felix made the big comeback and penthouse ish, they did like the dudley's thing where Bubba Ray would hold the guy's legs up and Devon would do the headbutt off the top into the guy's nuts. But what Penthouse did was come off the top and drop kick both guys in the nuts right in front of the referee. And and JR said, Was that a low blow? Like <laughs> <laughs> he still, after two years, he still doesn't get that they're just gonna do this shit regardless, right? And it, whether it makes any sense or not. But anyway. The Lucha Brothers started doing their shit, but FTR was getting a match out of these guys that made sense with, and still letting them do their stuff. It There was still too much four-way in front of the referee, but at least all the shit looked real good. And, and FTR were there for it, and there wasn't everybody falling all over the top of each other. Um, and they did some more shit that I couldn't keep track of, and then... Tully ran down and drew the referee and Dax grabbed one of the belts and hit Felix while he was coming to do a thing. And they hit a finish on him. Boom. One, two, three. And they're the new triple a tag team champions. And I like their new music too. It sounds familiar, but, um, so, okay. I'm not going to complain. They got a good match out of the Lucha brothers. They beat somebody, even if it wasn't for the real tag team title, it was for a tag team title. They can crow about that, their heels. And hopefully this means that they'll be next in line to relieve Penthouse and Felix of their other jewelry. But, uh, I mean, I think this is as probably as good as the Lucha Brothers could ever be. I've never seen them in a match where they did their shit, but it still made for the most part since what do you think i love this whole segment the match was enjoyable i've liked the lucha brothers specifically phoenix a little bit more than you traditionally in the past but i really like this i like the helplessness on alex abrahante's face as everything was transpiring <laughs> little things like that it plays into a bigger story we find out with mjf and andrade which leads to andrade almost being bearable on the mic for a moment but this was great, and I think, you know, we've had so many complaints for a while, and even a few weeks ago when I brought up that things look to be changing, you jumped all over me, but there has been a change in the oh, way... Oh, it was that... Wait, wait a minute. Was that a backhanded I told you so slid in there? 
uh, I don't know, backhanded or overhanded. I don't know how you want to Forehand, consider it. Backhand, forehand, but knife edge. But I, you knife know, knife edge. I told you so. Oh, right to the throat. They started giving them some matches, and although they did the job, the Sting, it was the best match Sting has had in a long time. He looked great. The fans were into it. It was a special New York show. I could forgive that. Everyone they put in the ring with FTR in the last two months has looked better with FTR than they have with anyone else, in my eyes. They're getting over. They're a part of something with MJF, so they're always tied into that, so they're always on the heel side, so that's good. People were into this. I'm happy with this. I'm happy. They may not be the world tag team champions right now, and they may not be kicking the shit out of the Cucamonga kids, but I'm happy with the way FTR has been used, I don't know, for the last six weeks, two months, somewhere in there. I just... With a lot of <laughs> no excuses for how they were used for the first year and a half, two no, years. No, that, that's yeah. what I'm saying. And, and later on with Miro, I'm just like, wait a minute, these guys that can do this, and for however long they were doing that and the other, I don't, I have never. All right. Anyway, next up was Tony Schiavone. It, it is Tony. I know the interviews are pre-taped that are in the back, but they're playing them as live. Does anybody ever wonder? How Tony Schiavone is a 60-something-year-old man, never out of breath, even though he's in every fucking segment, every scene. He did every interview in the back. Then they come out, and he's out at the fucking table. I mean, so anyway, Tony was in the back with Leo and Dante. Um, Leo and Dante. Sounds like a takeoff on Mephisto and Dante, which was Dennis Condry's first tag team, by the way. Mephisto and Dante, he and Joe Turner, Joe Sky, his father-in-law, uh, were the masked Mephisto and Dante for Leroy McGurk in late 72. Anyway, um, so basically Leo Rush is saying, well, Dante Martin failed tonight, and he knows that. He do, Due to his own doing, he realizes that. But I'm going to take care of this because I'm going to be his new tag team partner. And it's news to Dante. So that's why I'm saying, I don't, you know, are, are they, are they trying to insinuate that Dante is so gullible that he doesn't realize what this guy is doing to him when they've had no, they've got no long-term friendship. They've got no, nothing that bonds them together. Why didn't he just tell this guy to piss up a rope and hit the bricks? I don't, I don't th- know. I don't think they've necessarily played him as gullible yet. He's been apprehensive, and maybe this is some way, and it may not be the way I think it should be, and who knows how it'll play out, but maybe it's some way of getting him back with his brother when he comes off the injury list and putting them into something with Leo and a partner, and based on size and everything else, if you're going to have Leo wrestle and style, maybe those are the guys you have him wrestle. Maybe it'll be good. Yeah. Maybe I won't come in your mouth. (laughs) All right, then. Tony Schiavone was with F- FTR and Andre Oli Olio and MJF in a stairway. And MJF took the payoff and hugged Andre for uh, loaning him the, and, and made, they made sure to mention it was only this time that I loaned you FTR. So that was that. And next, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to give them demerits for this one. I didn't watch it, but the reason I didn't watch it was because pockets starts coming out, right? Pockets and Wheeler, Utah. And I figure, well, this is going to be some kind of joke. So I start fast forwarding and I see Moxley comes out. Well, then I hit the double fast forward because I know it's going to take him three or four minutes to get in from the parking lot. And I'm wondering, wait a minute, why would Mox be beating up a baby face? And then I realize, well, it doesn't make any sense because nothing he does make any makes any sense. And by the time that I had dwelled on that, he'd already beat the guy and it was over with. So I'm not going to get, but they put Moxley for whatever reason as a name to some people. He's on the show. It didn't take long. And the guy that Pockets was with got beat. So I can't give him demerits for that. Did I miss anything? I don't know. My least favorite wrestler. I didn't really pay him too much attention. Ogie dogie. But now, Tony's in the back with Serena Deeb. And he asks her about her attitude change. Because apparently they've just decided to switch her heel. And she starts to 
explain her reasoning, and suddenly a girl that was never identified attacked her, and they got into a big fight, and they just cut away from the fight while the girls were still fighting. Who was that girl? I don't remember now. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was it was not a well-lit area. They got in a fight. The camera backed up. The girl was, her, her face was not visible to the camera most of the time. Nobody said her name. Tony immediately ran off. Here's the thing now. You've got adult male referees and announcers and girls getting fights that are half their size in front of them and they don't just grab each one by the collar and go, okay, break it up. Anyway, guess what they cut away to? Well, let me just jump in. I just looked it up. The woman that attacked Serena Deeb? Yes. Hikaru Shida. Ah, she's mad because she screwed her out of her 50th victory. Now it all makes sense. (laughs) Now it all makes sense. Well, I didn't say it didn't make any sense. It just is phony because she talks for 13 seconds and then this girl jumps in and just they just fight and nobody does anything about it. And they cut away and go back to the ring so that they can have more. We don't know if the police were called. I mean, Punk's having a joke about it. Punk's doing the jokes. It's like, well, I'll tell you what. I don't know if it's more dangerous in the ring or back in the back area. That's the most dangerous. Because <laughs> anyway, they come back to the ring. And this I am going to give them demerits for. The Hardly Boys and Adam Cole with Don Fallis and Brandon Cutlett against the Dork Order in a six-man tag. And here is exactly what I wrote. Oh, fuck no. I'm liking this show. I'm not fucking tolerating this. To see Adam Cole, I'm not going to suffer through the Hardly Boys and the Dorks. And guess what happened to me while trying to get through this match? What? I hit the fast forward on a DVR, right? So it's fast forwarding so I get through the match. And the batteries died in my remote control and it got stuck on fast forward. And once the match is over with and now I'm seeing fucking MJF and I'm like, no, wait, wait. And I'm hitting the button. It won't stop fast forwarding. Uh, So I have to run down in the kitchen and grab the new double A's and get them in the, uh, in the remote and bring it to stop the runaway fast forward. Normally on most of the shows, I would have appreciated that. But in this case, I wanted to see what was going on anyway. Um, what did I just talk? About? Did you have any thoughts about uh, the, the match that I did not watch? No young Good. bucks, dark order. Didn't care. Oh, uh, but oh, then we, before MJF, we came up on the, Arn Anderson and Cody Rhodes at wrestling school segment where Arn brings Cody to his wrestling school where everybody can tell him what a piece of shit he is and red velvet can slap him in the face. And that's what the Lee Johnson and Brock Anderson and red velvet all lined up and basically said, fuck you. And she slapped him. And then they did drills with Cody and Arn had him beat him up again. And then red velvet slapped him again. <laughs> I don't know if I can see Dusty in this position. No, because Dusty had instincts. And Cody's trying to be something he's not. And will the fans take this? Because this is obviously an attempt to keep him babyface. You have to shed your Hollywood. You have to shed the douchebagginess. If you got a divorce, maybe you'd be a babyface. But you have to shed all these things and go back to being who you were. When? When was he ever that guy? I just think things have moved Did on. he? Have, wait a minute. Did he ever know a guy named T.C. Lee that he was digging ditches next to that told him that he would one day be the American dream if he had $2 to rub together? Or was he a privileged child, a privileged child of douchebaggery with the silver spoon firmly in his orifice? I'm not quite sure they are a dream machine, but I'll say this, that... You know, they had Art Anderson show up in Cody's backyard and burn his items, <laughs> begging the question, where are the police? Yeah. And now there's this... From the from the reality show, we know he lives in a decent neighborhood. I can't believe somebody didn't call the authorities when there was this mysterious, pudgy, bald man starting fires and burning items in uh, in his backyard. His neighbors have to hate him, right? Like, oh, they're filming again. Now they're pretending that they're having fun at the pool. Now they're doing this. <laughs> now they're pretending they're doing this. 
But Arn burned this stuff in the backyard. Now there's this whole thing. I don't know why Red Velvet's so mad. Cody didn't really do anything bad to Red Velvet. He kind of elevated her. She's the one who got elevated the most, really, at yeah. all of them. I'll teach you to let me stand in for your wife and be in the same match as Shaquille O'Neal. Pow! So I I'm not... This. Again, and the thing is, just like Cody's reality show, the Bucks and Omega and everyone on top has nothing to do with any of this. It's like a whole separate universe, the Cody-verse. The Cody Academy. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're over there doing all this Cody stuff. And maybe if Lee Johnson meant more because he was used differently, people would care. Maybe if Brock had been used differently and meant more, people would care. I don't know. I think, you know, if you put Cody against someone, if you put Cody against Dan Lambert, yeah, maybe they'll cheer Cody. But I think if you put Cody against anyone there who you think may be a heel or on the cusp, like a Miro or something, I don't think it's going to end well because Cody, there's nothing likable about the character that he is. Ever since he got that tattoo, that splotch on his neck was the shark that he jumped. And there's been no turning back since. And again, with that reality show, no signs of Omega and the Bucks. They knew to stay away from that, just like everyone there knows, to stay away from Cody's stuff, because you get too close, you're not going to be happy with what you're but doing. good God, what does that say when the three most insufferable twats in the company don't want to be on your program? How insufferable are you? Well, there you go. Pretty sufferable. All right. <laughs> Next. Well played. MJF made the entrance for his in-ring promo, and the first thing he said in Miami was, Silencio, por favor. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. And then he told him the town reeks of hookers and gasoline. Uh, he did his... He ain't wrong. Uh, he ain't wrong there. Uh, did his own ring introduction for the, the uh, match that he's supposed to have with... Darby Allen, tell me the truth, Brian. You know the area. Is Plainview, Long Island, really the most magical place on earth? Oh, no, no. I mean, <laughs> no disrespect to MJF if he would ever hear this, but Plainview is no Long Beach. Plainview is no Lido Beach. Plainview is no Atlantic Beach. Plainview is just a son of a beach. <laughs> Very good. But no, I would say in Nassau County, Plainview is as close to Suffolk County as you get. Well, that means something to somebody. But anyway, he called Darby out, but oh, shucks, Darby's not here. He no-showed all you people. Oh, 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 wait, was he attacked last week? Well, that's terrible. I haven't heard of this. And of course, last week was MJF allegedly in the, in the ski mask and his minions, and they beat him up. But basically, MJF's point here is he broke Darby Allen mentally. He ragged on the fans. He had some fun. He calls Wardlow out. And Wardlow's dragging a referee with him, and he tells the referee to do the 10 count, of course, count Darby out, so he'll be counted out and win the match officially. And the referee gets to nine and then blackout, and it starts snowing. What do you think their snow budget is? Oh, I think there may be a big snow budget, actually, with AEW. <laughs> Maybe that's why they were in Miami. If it don't snow, we can't go. Thank you, Buddy Rose. Landell would have <laughs> would have loved this promotion, but anyway, it's, so Sting brings the snow, and here comes Sting, and as he comes into the ring with the ball bat, MJF shoves Wardlow into a bat shot and and powders out of the ring and <laughs> bails on him. So there you had that. Um, I enjoyed seeing MJF here, just have fun with these people, and they're still doing the thing with Wardlow. Now I've got to wonder when. They're trying to tease, they've been trying to tease dissension amongst MJF and Wardlow for some time with MJF bullying him, saying nasty things about him, whatever. And the idea behind that in wrestling, a la Kevin Sullivan and Rick Steiner long ago, or anybody else, Chris Candido and Boo Bradley, or whatever the case, it's been done a hundred thousand times. Jerry Lawler and Plowboy Frazier, 1976. Um... Finally, the big fucking, usually the big dumb guy, in this case, they haven't portrayed Wardlow as being a mental midget, but it's usually a big dumb guy, gets tired of being pushed around and fucking prodded, etc., and breaks his bonds of servitude and, and switches baby face and kicks the shit out of the heel. That's what the people want to see. But if you 
tease it too long by constantly having MJF do things like this or make remarks about Wardlow and Wardlow does nothing and says nothing after a period of time instead of a hot new baby face what you've got is just a dickless fucking guy that's just taking his brow beating and not doing anything about it and I hope that they don't introduce some far-fetched reason contractually or because who was it they did an angle i think it was in wwf a few years ago where somebody couldn't refuse to do the bidding of somebody else because they there was a, their family would go hungry or of someone who needed an operation some far-fetched the big show it was the big show yes yes and it, it, it's like it, they expect especially the wwe i can understand with some of these guys that have never been on TV before, you can believe some of the AEW talent would be one or two paychecks away from living in a street or under a bridge somewhere. But the WWE guys, when it's alleged that they'll go bankrupt or broke or have no other options unless they do this that they don't want to do. So I hope they don't do that with Wardlow. But the point is they have to juggle that timing. They can't just make him a, a pussy-whipped you know, flunky, because then the people won't be behind him if he ever does turn. Why did he take this brow beating, this sharp brow beating for so long? So that's the thing about MJF, that they have to be careful with his shit so sharp and so good verbally, and he means it. But you can, if you don't, when you're going over something in the back, it's easy when there's no emotion, there's no people hearing it, and you're not actually in the moment. It's sometimes easy to gloss over things, say, well, I'll say this and I'll say that. And when I say this, then you really get mad. You punch me. But when you're out there, the first thing you said was, and your mother should have swallowed you. And I, uh, any baby face worth their shit would be go, wait a minute. I'm not punching this guy right now. And the way the people just reacted to that, you got to watch that. They've got to take care that the things he says doesn't emasculate the baby face. I'm not saying he shouldn't be allowed to say them. I'm saying they should put some type of obstacle in between him and the baby face that prevents the baby face from knocking him on his ass when he does say it, unless it's time for him to be knocked on his ass. See what I'm saying? I see exactly what you're saying. And I mean, my big takeaway from this was MJF, as always, great on the mic. I don't know where they're going with this Wardlow stuff. You said they've been teasing it for a while. It's been over a year, I think a year yeah. and a half. There's it's like their teasers. third week together. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. I'll just say that MJF and Darby, it's been a few weeks now going back and forth. Darby's explaining why he is the way he is. MJF's calling him out and trying to mentally break him. At some point, there has to be something to heat this thing up, I think, uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, the illustrious Tony Schiavone was in the back again with Anna J. And Anna J says three syllables, and here comes Britt Baker and interrupts her. And Britt Baker did a pretty good job of blistering old Anna J verbally. And then guess what happened, Brian? I think a bunch of people started fighting with each other, right? They got in a fight <laughs> again. And again, Punk says, well, that's a dangerous place to be back there. And again, they cut away from this brawl with these guys. So that's two interviews that Tony Schiavone did in the backstage area with women that both ended exactly the same way in the same show. And then they come out to Kiera Hogan versus Penelope Pitstop. And I've got to admit, once again, I, th there wasn't anything wrong with Moxley and Yuta. I just didn't want to see Moxley walk in from the parking lot. So that was watchable, and it was short. I penalized them for the dork order and the, you know, elite, delete, whatever. But holy mackerel, shouldn't this have been on YouTube? I thought Kiera Hogan was either Hulk's daughter or Brooke's sister. Oh, no, I don't think so. CM Punk was kind of making that joke on commentary. Yes, yes. Uh, but I, I, he did? I thought I didn't know he did that because I didn't watch this. Um, what happened? I think Punk at one point said, you think there's any relation? 
<laughs> and then someone else said maybe Ben Hogan. Obviously, the word Hulk Hogan is not uttered anywhere near the show. And they had a match. And then the match ended. And we moved on with the show. All righty. And I, I will say this. Nothing against Kiara Hogan. I'm just seeing her recently the first few times. She seems all right. But I agree with you. This didn't belong on TV. Well, and again, it's Penelope Pitstop and the bunny, for God's sake. Miro! Now he's cutting promos on God. The guy's getting over with me. Usually I have less appeal for these people the more I see them, but Miro's getting over with me. He asked God, why have you forsaken me? You gave him, what was it, a body of granite but a neck of sand because they're playing that he's vulnerable to the DDT or whatever. Um, but Miro wants his belt back or elsewise he's switching heel on God. And I like this. This was good. If this is the first I'd seen of this guy, I wouldn't know he's a blithering idiot. I would never have any idea if this was the way I'd seen this guy first. Anyway, uh, after Miro threatened God, guess who was in the ring, Brian, last, right after that? I don't remember. Tony Schiavone. Tony Schiavone. <laughs> <laughs> I got to think, he's got to be doing cardio. And the thing is, he never does the interview. He might get to ask a question every once in a while. He it, Then he has to just jump out and be gone, but he's everywhere to start. Um, He introduces the winner of the title shot at whatever their show is coming up, Full Gear, Hangman Adam Page. And here comes Adam Page. Guess what he didn't have in his hand? A drink. Guess what he did? A real promo. This is the best, not only the best thing that Adam Page has done in two years on television there, I'm talking match, interview, anything. The best thing for Adam Page, maybe not the, the best thing for somebody else, but the best thing for Adam Page that he's ever done was this interview. This was maybe... Except for Punk's return, the best babyface promo ever on AEW television. He uh, he didn't mention the goofy, drunk, sappy bullshit. He didn't, you know. He alluded to, you know, his his failures, his problems that he's accepted, but he didn't talk about I was a, a sad, morose drunk. He didn't mention the dork order. He didn't mention, he mentioned his friends being the fans. He did what any baby face would do in that he has admitted that he had cut, fallen short in the past, but he bowed up then with resolution to do better in the future, he got the people to chant cowboy shit. He actually explained what cowboy shit was to him. He even got a pop and phrased and brought his having a baby in as in, and that's cowboy shit. So there wasn't about taking the fucking job guys for ice cream on his lawnmower and all the stupid shit he's been doing. He managed to turn this into something that had emotion to it. He dropped the drinks. He dropped the dorks. He spoke well. He had conviction. But this is where the whole interview was revolved around cowboy shit. And I cannot believe, uh, yes, I, I can believe it, I can believe that Tony Khan didn't explicitly go out and tell everybody else not say the word shit on the show. I can honestly believe, and I'm not surprised, that Chris Jericho knows better, and he went out and fucking shit all over Adam Page and said his word an hour beforehand just so that he could get the pop for fat face dipshit. But I'm astonished that, that this wasn't protected any more than it was, but it was the best thing that Adam Page has ever done on television. What'd you think? It was certainly the best promo he's ever done, and it was the promo he needed the most right now. So I think it was perfect in that sense. It's hard for me to see a promo like this. I hate to go back to Cody, but how's Cody going to get over as a babyface when you have a guy like this doing a promo like this? He also had a baby. 
and he explained it in a way that made him a baby face. Yeah. <laughs> I think this was good. This was needed. Did nothing to take away from any excitement towards the Omega match. If anything, it was quite the opposite. Now, after this promo, maybe someone says, wow, I really don't know what they're going to do. Maybe they will have him win the belt. He did this promo. We really don't know, but I thought this was great. Yeah, and... And I agree with you about Jericho doing his thing to get the cheap pops earlier. It was unnecessary yeah. if you're doing this. But that's that's... If this guy is able to do this, why is it the first time in two years he's done this? I guess because the ice cream store was open and the dork order was thirsty. Or whatever. But anyway, uh, then... Let's go ahead and finish it off strong. I can't believe that they 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 teetered with the Dork Order six man, and they bored us a bit. Uh, not me because I skipped it with the you know underneath girls match, but generally something falls in a big hole on this program, and they didn't. They finished strong. Brian Danielson and Bobby Fish, and no, this is not a marquee dream match that would you know draw mega millions on pay-per-view but it was an excellent television wrestling match it bobby fish is tremendous he's great talent and it was the proper use of brian danielson because i gotta be honest with you the same thing's gonna happen to danielson as has happened to punk the the temptation is going to be there to put Danielson on television as much as possible to try to get a rating, whether it works or not. And, and are they going to water his opponents down? Very possibly. Um, but this was not... Brian Danielson and Bobby Fish should be a competitive match because Fish is that good and still gets the, the point across we got Brian Danielson wrestling on our television show. It's a step above, in my opinion, putting Punk against just a random underneath guy, you know, and, and it didn't hurt that fish just came over from the other, the other program, but, but the, you know, it, it, Brian Danielson was over like crazy on his entrance, people yesing. And they did nice stuff that both these guys have an MMA slash wrestling hybrid style that they're both pros. They're really crisp. Uh, this is where Punk made the great points that only a wrestler would say about coming down after matches. But, you know, when you're, you're, I mean, for anybody that's performed on a wrestling show, especially a major one, you're bouncing off the walls of your hotel room three o'clock in the morning still because you can't just turn all that off. That's why so many guys have substance issue problems. If you got to get up at six o'clock in the morning for a fucking plane and you didn't go to bed till four, at three or four days in a row of that, we'll get on you. They were talking about the recovery period after a hard match that they had just wrestled the night before. And Punk was making that point. And he sounds legitimate and sincere about what he's saying because that part was true. He's mastered, let me say as much true shit as possible so the people believe everything I say because the majority of it, they know on the face of it to be true. And that's any great wrestler and any great con man will take that tactic. Um, again, Danielson hit a dive and got a big pop, but then he tried to throw fish back in the ring where he could beat him. But fish fought back and stopped Danielson for the, the heat to go into the break. And coming back, Fish got heat on Danielson's leg. He sold it really well. Fish was heelish. Danielson's fighting from underneath. They threw nice forearms. Bobby Fish looks more like a former UFC champion than Junior Dos Santos does in a working environment, which is a lesson that some of them ought to learn. You need to use the shooters and you need to use the mainstream celebrities, but don't put them in positions that exposes their weaknesses. Did you see that Chris Jericho said Junior Dos Santos hit a home run or some shit that is his debut, he's a natural? I didn't see that, but I'm not at all surprised that Chris Jericho put out a delusional statement. <sighs> if they could have just kept him from trying to work his strikes. Anyway, 
So Danielson finally then classic fucking baby face comeback that I have not seen anybody do in forever. Then it used to be a regular thing and it makes perfect sense. The people want to see the baby face make a comeback and do to the heel what the heel did to the baby face. That was the first thing I learned when I got in the wrestling business from the boys. So usually what does the baby faces come back these days have to do with what happened to him during the heat? Absolutely nothing. But in this case, fish got the heat on Danielson's leg. And when Danielson made the comeback, he started wrapping fish's leg around that ring post. Fuck you. Bam. Here, have this. Oh, Jesus Christ. That makes perfect sense. And the people get into it more because now it's tit for tat. That used to be. The concept was a basic spot in wrestling. If you were working a spot show with a guy you'd never met before, right? You didn't know anything about him. You're the heel and he's the baby face. What do you do? You lock up and you fucking arm drag the baby face. And you get up and you crow about it. You strut. You laugh and you point at him. Then you lock up and you fucking hip toss him. And you do the same thing. And then you lock up and you scoop him up and body slam him. And you do the same thing. And while you're laughing about that, fucking baby face gets pissed. So when you lock up again, he arm drags the heel. Then he hip tosses the heel. Then he body slams the heel. And the heel comes up with a shit all over his face. Like, what the fuck? And the baby face drop kicks him. Out he goes to the floor. The baby face fucking gets his glory. The baby face gives the heel back taste of his own medicine. Anyway, Fish finally got back on offense and hit that, they call it the Falcon Arrow. It's kind of a superplex, but land split-legged. Off the top rope, which was a heck of a bump, got a two count. Uh, then they fought over trying to get a fucking knee bar and some kicks, and Danielson got to heel hook, and Fish tapped out, and it was a great match. So and nothing unprofessional, nothing, no obvious cooperation, no burying the referee. The influx of serious talent is making segment after segment of this show better just because they're professional and they know how to work and they know what to do. And if the indie-rific core group of mullet heads that started this process would try to learn from these guys, then you now we're in a situation where with AEW, it used to be the complete amateur hour. Now it's, you might get a great segment between two mainstream stars and a good match, and then it might be followed by my little dog pockets. And everybody laughs and gets up, scratch their balls and take a shit. But at least... If it, if they if it can be if it if they can keep from being too schizophrenic, this TV show was better top to bottom than anything the WWE has done top to bottom in months. They don't have Paul Heyman and Roman Reigns at AEW, but by the same token, WWE unfortunately no longer has Brian Danielson, CM Punk, Adam Cole, and yada yada yada. So. Ah, oh, closing thoughts on your part. Good episode of Dynamite. Those are my closing thoughts. Good match. You know, I can't really say too much other than what you said. It wasn't the greatest match. It was a really good match, especially for TV, and it ended the show on a good note. And that was AEW Dynamite, and of course... There you go! <laughs> and then there we go, and of course, I will say, coming out of AEW Dynamite, that... Perhaps a young man is looking for a transition that just isn't there <laughs> for what remains of the sponsors left on the docket for this week's show. And now, of course, we could talk about one's pubic shavings, but who wants to do that? I think more exciting is the idea of a new career, of starting something from scratch, from home, learning a new skill, one that you can apply across the board, like you can from our friends at Code Academy. Well, you know what? I've got to apologize, not only to Code Academy, but also to the to the public at large out there. I know I've struggled because I wasn't wasn't up on the newfangled information. I've struggled with some of the the Code Academy spots because I wasn't exactly sure 
about the whole thing, but you've helped me, Brian. And also, I saw a documentary the other night on the, the whole coding and the thing, and it, it was fascinating, and it's given me new insight into this. Because, for example, I had, I had mentioned before that, you know, with Code Academy, you can get qualified for in-demand jobs in as little as two months. You can learn at your own pace and your own level. You can choose what to learn from building websites to analyzing data and everything else you could want. No matter what your experience level, you'll be writing real working code in minutes. That's right. But, but I wasn't used to all this, so I didn't understand the whole concept of the code. And when I saw coding languages like Python and Hitamal, Sys and Squickle, and JavaScript. That's not, that's not how you say those and et cetera. things. Well, I know that now because I saw this documentary and it, it it clued me in. Because remember, we've talked about the instant feedback that you get from Code Academy, where your code is tested as soon as you submit it. And and also they they have meetings. Uh, they have a community of over 50 million people, and they you can get help from other people in the forum or connect with people near you and they have these meetings and I saw the documentary and what confused me was they didn't call it speaking in code in this documentary they called it speaking in tongues but they have the meetings they wear robes no. they they, <laughs> they stop say it? these things like the hitamal sis uh, squall and no that's a completely... script and all that and then they all raise no. their arms to the sky no and then this guy comes in and he's carrying a fucking snake. No, this and is they're not. All handling no. these snakes, and they're letting the snakes bite them willy nilly at random. But what they're vulnerable is this? because they've learned to speak in the tongues, or as as they call it at Code Academy, speak in the codes. And it's an amazing group of people. <laughs> and so, folks, if you want to join this, and I think they supply the snakes. However. You can uh, you can land your dream job in web development, programming, computer science, data science, and tons more. You can learn from home. You only have to go out to the meetings whenever they they have the snakes and the robes. So, folks, go to Code Academy. That's C O D E C A D E M Y. CodeCademy dot com, and use the promo code Experience. You're going to get fifteen percent off. Your Code Academy Pro membership. Join the millions of people learning to code with Code Academy and see where coding can take you. As I said, you use the promo code Experience at Code Academy to get 15% off your Code Academy Pro membership. Get a new, a new job, a new career, a new way of life. 15% off your Code Academy Pro membership. When you use the promo code experience at codecademy.com, I think the 15% also includes robes and snakes. Learn to speak in tongues or in codes at codecademy.com. What was the name of this documentary you saw? It was the Snake Handlers of Sri Lanka. Oh, what channel was that on? It was on channel Mind Your Own. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, I think I have that cable system. Yeah. Over here. Mind your own. It's right up one one button up from Nunya. Have you ever seen any of those people in the giant robes in person? No, but I saw a couple of those snakes. <laughs> I'll tell you a story without using the person's name. This made me think of it. Whatever you just butchered in that spot made me think of this. There was a guy in my hometown of Long Beach who, from the little bit I knew him in person, was a very nice guy. He had a son who was the same age as my little brother. So I got to know him a little bit because his son and my little brother became friends and started hanging out. Yeah, they were they were the ones carrying the snakes. This guy was the nicest guy. He was like a sweetheart. I mean, he was just the nicest guy. Turns out he was also a guy who would go onto the Long Beach boardwalk with giant pictures of dead fetuses and get on a bullhorn and yell at people. Now, no one wants to hear that in general, let alone on a beautiful summer's day when you're on the boardwalk with your family and you're enjoying the sun and the surf. And here's this guy screaming at you about abortion. And one day someone got in trouble because they rode by on a bicycle and punched him in the face and they got into a brawl on the boardwalk. He became somewhat notorious. I believe they banned him from the boardwalk. While all this is going on, I'm thinking how funny it is because he's such a nice guy. Why is he... Such a lunatic. Now, I'm not saying, ha well, look, whatever your beliefs are, fine. But going on the boardwalk with a fucking bullhorn and placards, that may be a step too far. Probably not the way to go about it. Two years later, 
I had a meeting in the city and I took the train to Penn Station and I went out onto 7th Avenue to cross the street to start walking. So whenever I can walk instead of the subway, I prefer to walk. And there's a commotion in the crosswalk and I can't figure out what it is, but I have to know what it is because it's such a commotion. I get close to it and it's that guy in a fucking giant robe <laughs> with a giant curved walking stick that was bigger than him. He was like 6'2". The stick must have been 6'6", six, because six, I could see the stick before I could see him. And I'm already laughing, and he has a the, is it, was it Was it like the sheep herders type of curved thing yes, there? With yes, the, yes. I don't know why he had that. That's on a Penn Station at 9 in the morning. But there he is, and I get close enough to hear him on his little PA. And all I hear is, and the Jews! And I said, oh, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to go the other way and not say hello to Jack today. <laughs> and luckily he didn't see me because I was afraid he would pull me into whatever we, he had going on there. But when I think of people in robes speaking in tongues, that's one of the people I think of. Codecademy.com. I think Codecademy could have helped him. He would have been off the boardwalk and making some money. Yeah. Well... Let's get off this boardwalk and make <laughs> well, some money. That's a deep subject, as Mama Cornette used to say. That's right. Well, Jim, we have a lot of deep questions, a lot of deep thoughts, not sent by Jack Handy, but sent by the listeners of Jim Cornette's drive through And let's go to this first one. Sent on Twitter, using the hashtag Corny drive through from DarbyFan68. Do you think Rampage usually being taped hurts the ratings? Wrestling websites post the results soon after the show is taped. So there's no need to watch to see who wins. Oh, good Lord. Well, then there. Okay, if if you're a history buff, is there a reason to read a book on World War II? Because you know how it ended. Um, you kind of figure when you go to the movies that if you're going to see Superman, you know, chances are he's probably going to come out on top at the end of the movie or whatever. No, I I think what hurts Rampage or hurts any program is when they taped it in one of those marathon taping sessions. It, it and and they've done it from ten to midnight or whatever. It, it those WWF tapings in the mid nineties that used to go from seven thirty till fucking midnight with umpteen job matches. Those were brutal for people to sit through and watch. Um. It hurts the atmosphere on television. I don't think that it, 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 and the ratings have borne this out over years and years. The back when they used to make a big deal out of it, when WCW in the nineties went uh, live with nitro every week and raw was still in that transition period. We used, when I started, we used to do it once a month. We would do four shows on a Monday, one live and three on tape. And then you were done with raw for the month. Um, then WCW starts going live. And so raw starts doing a deal where one is live and one is taped. And before they went all the way live, it's all the way live. It's lakeside, by the way, all the way live. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's all the way live. It's all the way live, all the way. Pa -pa 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 -pa. Anyway, Ric Flair said precious was all the way live. She certainly was. Having said that, all of that, um, Back in those days, no, it did not make a, it, the difference in the tape shows and the live shows ratings was negligible. And for the most part, unless it's, yes, I agree, if there's some startling, shocking surprise or a title change, th th that getting out kind of, I don't know in these days whether it throws water on it or whether then people just want to you know, say, oh, shit, I got to see that. I got to see that title change or I've got to see this debut or whatever, even if they know about it ahead of time. But I think it's been borne out in multiple examples over a period of time. It doesn't matter whether it's a tape show or live show. If they want to watch it, they're going to watch it. What matters is if it's a show they're not watching to begin with, live or taped ain't going to make any difference. And if it's... uh if it's something that's not on the radar, it's, you know, that's not a big deal. But for the, uh, for AEW or WWE, except for a big event, like a pay-per-view for AEW or whatever they call their big shows these days over across the street, 
It doesn't make any difference. If you haven't seen it, it's new to you. All right, Jim, our next question sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Jeremy in Minneapolis. That's in Minnesota, right? I believe so. That's what I have heard. While touring some house shows this weekend in the El Paso, Texas, and Albuquerque, New... I think he means New Mexico. He wrote Northwest. Albuquerque, Northwest. <laughs> the Albuquerque, New Mexico area. Rhea Ripley had her luggage lost by the airlines. The check bag included her tag team championship belt Ooh. and some of her favorite wrestling gear. She has made appeals through social media to watch out for anyone attempting to sell memorabilia or if the luggage went to a different airport. Today, getting a replacement title and new wrestling gear is much easier than 30 years ago. <laughs> and we know from Ric Flair's controversy with Jim Hurd that security deposits could run as high as $25,000. What protective measures did wrestlers take to make sure their title or wrestling gear didn't get lost? Were there backup protective measures taken, other than Bobby Eaton seemingly having everything from sewing needles <laughs> to bootlaces with him as a spare? Oh, God, where to start with this? For one thing, the, the $25,000 deposit that the and, and at various points in time it, I've been reading up on some St. Louis history. Thez one time put ten grand up, and actually I think Muchnick fronted him the ten grand because they knew Thez is fine, right? Other people, it was twenty Rogers had twenty five grand up. It wasn't a deposit for the belt. It was a deposit for the actual championship. The belt, even the NWA World Heavyweight title belt, until they got the the big modern gold, the big belt that Flair got in 1986, that was worth more than 25. That was worth 28 grand is what Crockett paid for it in 1986. Um, but the deposit was not for the belt itself. It was for the championship to make sure that the world champion would lose the title when it was asked of him and as directed and to who. The belt was obviously something that you took care of, but the promoters weren't worried about losing the belt as much as they were about a double cross on the world. See, the world championship in wrestling was the most valuable single thing in the sport of professional wrestling from the time it started until the 1980s. And whichever version of the world title... That's why there were double crosses over it. That's why people tried to steal it. That's why I've, and I'm not talking about the belt again. I'm talking about the actual title, the championship. If you gay, if the NWA promoters, especially, which was the widest recognized title for so many years, if they gave some wrestler the honor and responsibility and highly paid job of being the world champion they also wanted to know that they could switch that belt to the person they wanted to at the end of that guy's run with no problems. And so the, the champion, in order to receive that belt, in order to have that spot, in order to have that paying position, would put money up. And what was, well, in, 19, in the early 60s, Rogers had 25 grand or whatever. Flair had 25 grand. In the 70s, that's the equivalent of $100,000 or more in today's money, one would think. But that's what it was worth because if that guy's the world champion, all of a sudden, let's say the NWA world champion decided to make a deal with Vince McMahon and went there with the belt. Fuck! That would be disaster. It would kill the NWA's business. That was when people legitimately took the world championship as important and it had to be won and lost in the ring. So that was the, the, the bond was put up specifically so nobody would get funny. And, and I guess they even back then, they didn't think that, well, Vince senior wouldn't have tried to undermine that and give somebody his 25 grand and to turn around and fuck the NWA. Vince junior would have, but Vince senior wouldn't have. So it, it worked back in those days. As far as not losing the belt on the airline or anything else, nobody ever checks a fucking belt. Flair never checked that. Flair got on the every plane I ever saw him getting on with 
his suit on, his tie on, his a goddamn brush that he was brushing his hair in one hand and his bag in the other hand that had the belt. He would check even I mean sometimes he carried a robe on too, but he would check gear, he would check regular clothes, he would check some stuff, but the belt would never be checked. That would be on his, on him or with him at all times. When the Midnight Express were champions, I never checked fucking tag team belts. I carried them on my carry-on because I've never liked to check my property anyway. It comes from being an only child. Fuck you. I'm going to hand this to you and you're just going to promise me I'm going to get it in Cleveland? Fuck you. So I always, I very rarely checked anything. I had a suit bag and a carry-on bag and I would put the belts either in my carry-on bag or right on top of them or right on top of it so that I could see them all the time, and they would be in the, you know, you wouldn't just be able to see it's a title belt, they'd be in the fucking belt bag. But I kept those with me every plane we were ever on. Um, I mean, it's happened 20 million times in the wrestling business that the airline lost somebody's bag and they had to borrow gear or borrow tights. That's why I always joke about Kushida. The Delta lost his bag again, huh? Because that's the way guys used to look when they had to fucking wrestle in their street clothes because they had nothing else. So, yeah, I mean, everybody now has multiple items of gear and these belts, the replicas are as good a quality as the regular belts and there's no longer just one championship belt that represents, you know, that title in every company. There's multiple of them. So it's not as big a deal as it used to be. But yeah, losing your gear, that would happen because guys... You know, always, especially if they were on the road for a couple of weeks, had more stuff than you could carry on. But losing a belt, I've still, I've, I can't imagine anybody ever checks a belt. I don't know why the fuck you would do that. Even if you have to put it in your seat and sit on it, why anybody would check a belt is crazy. But Well, remember, Chris Jericho had the AEW belt stolen from him right after he had won it. I'm curious, when you hear stuff like this, and you see that the wrestler goes to social media. What do you think of that? The idea of the wrestler, and it may not even be the wrestler, the airline in this case, maybe losing the gear, but going to social media to try to get people to look out for it. You have any issue with that? Well, it, here's the thing. If she had left it sitting at the car rental counter at the airport, I'd do that. Or if it was mistakenly left in the trunk of a rental car, which has happened, or if it was mistakenly left in a building which has happened or if any of the other thing but if she checked it and it didn't come out the other side then it's somewhere in the airline system they've they've sent i mean we they do stupid things because think of just the sheer number of bags and people that they handle but one time we flew a non-stop flight from baltimore back to charlotte and somehow the, the, it was a over full flight and they forced us to check shit and i even checked my stuff and instead of going from baltimore to charlotte it went from baltimore to chicago and it was you know that was the only time i'd checked something in like a three-year period and it got you know missent somewhere but i wouldn't go to social media if it's still somewhere in the delta Airlines system one would think it's just circling around the goddamn baggage carousel in fucking des moines somewhere if she if if she checked it and it did not arrive at the other end, we don't know what all the details are. Your first 10 years in the business, who was the most untrustworthy person you saw them put a belt on that you were surprised? Oh, my God, I can't believe they're giving him this responsibility. Oh, my God. Well, gee, many Pete. Um, you know, now that. Uh, I'm trying to think in, in Memphis, I mean, you know, it depended on the belt for heaven's sake, the Southern heavyweight title has uh, been around more than the, the school who the night before the prom. Um, everybody's had a chance at that. Remember when they did the angle with snowman and that didn't work out with the USWA title. Snowman just passed away a couple weeks ago. Eddie Marlin came out and said he, he sold the belt to buy drugs on TV. Yeah. 1990. Um, but the question you asked, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of somebody that was at the, I mean, honestly, Shawn Michaels, after the first time that I had a problem with him, I'd have never put another one on him. Uh, even though he was a, 
main event guy. But a lot of times the guys that got belts got there, you know, within hindsight, 40 years later, you say, why would he ever put a belt on that guy? But at the time it wasn't that bad. You thought it might straighten him out or whatever. Although, you know, well, think about that. When did, did they ever put a belt on Sid? Yes. Which one? They put the world title on Sid. Not in W, didn't WCW? In WWE. Oh, in w, ah, well, I wasn't paying attention. Um, <laughs> you were there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I still wasn't paying. I wasn't paying any attention. You were on the booking team. <laughs> no, not when Sid was the champion. I wasn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that would be a surprise. Of uh, just because you yes, know, yes, you were. They come calling. Didn't Sid beat Shawn Michaels in '96 at the Survivor Series so he could lose the title back to him at the Alamo Dome? Son of a bitch! You may be right. Well, there you go. All right, well, let's get another question here. Let's Wasn't see. my idea. Wasn't your idea. We can certainly all know that here in your I, thoughts I on Sid. If somebody had a gun to their head and they were forced to answer the question, was Jim Cornette in favor of making Sid Vicious a world champion? I think they, would, they wouldn't have any fear of their life on answering that one. And if things had gone better, that would have been Vader's spot, right? Well, yeah, that was originally Vince's idea was uh, SummerSlam disputed finishes restarts sean ekes out of victory vader wins its survivor series and then that's the whole reason they booked the alamo dome in san antonio sean's hometown so that he could come and win back his boyhood dream in front of his hometown crowd and of course and then they ended up having to put in a cheap ticket and heavily paper it because two reasons number one 1997 wwf was not stadium business wwf and number two everybody that knew Shawn michaels personally wished him nothing but ill will so his hometown fans didn't want to see him win the fucking belt anyway well jim i don't know if you've seen a recent picture of Shawn michaels but his hair is quite the sight and considering how it's cropped now how it's no longer the ratty mess hiding the bald spots as it was for so many years i almost wonder if he's been using manscaped on his scalp well, it wouldn't surprise me a bit that Shawn Michaels would not be able to figure out how to use the Manscaped products and use them on his on the wrong head because he's always used his wrong head ever since he's gotten into wrestling business. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's now shaving the wrong head, courtesy of our fine friends at Manscaped.com. But I'll tell you what, you want to talk about the Manscaped customer service, Brian? I have an email. From Jason in Alabama. Dear Jim and Brian, the customer service at Manscaped is the best. I bought a performance package a while ago, so long ago, I got the 3.0 package because the 4.0 had not been released yet. Anyway, I forgot to put in my promo code JCE. When I remembered it, I figured it was my screw up and I blew my 20% discount. Today, I got an email from Manscaped saying my refills were on the way. It jogged my memory, and I decided to contact them and ask if I could get 20% off an upcoming order. If they couldn't do that, oh well, I'd already written off my discount anyway. Within three hours, I got a response stating I was refunded the 20%, not off the refill order, but my original order of the performance package. The heading on the email fittingly said, we're men of our word, great products, and great customer service. Well, if you can't believe Jason in Alabama, who the fuck can you believe? Folks, do you know what's spookier than seeing a black cat on Halloween? It's shaving your balls with anything other than Manscaped. What? When it comes to, I'm reading this directly off the screen, when it comes to <laughs> below-the-waist grooming, there's no need to carve your pumpkins this Halloween because Manscaped is here to upgrade your grooming experience. Go from a bite-sized candy bar to a king-sized candy bar. Holy mackerel, and talk about that cream filling. And join the 2 million men Jesus. worldwide by going to manscaped.com slash JCE for 20% off and free shipping. Folks, have you ever tried to trim your balls and it turned into a Freddy Krueger film? Luckily, Manscaped is here to save the day and make sure you're smelling fresh with their new refined body wash. Fellas, the ladies love their signature scent. 
and it will scare away those vampires. That's right. It has garlic in it. The garlic crop, uh, cr- crotch wash from Manscaped. <laughs> the, what? the garlic crotch wash will keep those vampires away. I don't see that on the website. Well, it's new. Keep the grooming game going. <laughs> With the Performance Package 4.0 inside the holy grail of men's grooming items, they've made it easy for you to upgrade your grooming routine, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Tea Time Movies. It's a full moon out, but the werewolf in your pants is howling. It's time to tackle that problem with the Lawnmower 4.0. <laughs> They're finely tuned trimmers featuring a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced. Skin safe technology, words and phrases at random. <laughs> lawnmower 4.0. <laughs> the Lawnmower 4.0 is easily the greatest ball hair trimmer on the planet. Easily. And it's, it's waterproof. Easily. And a runaway. It's no contest. <laughs> and it's waterproof. The Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker. It also includes, which is the obviously the nose and ear hair trimmer. Who doesn't know that? Uh, prevents nicks, sags, and tugs in those delicate holes. You can even even use them on your better half in some of her delicate holes and get all that crap out of there. What? Folks, Manscaped, the Performance Package 4.0. They even throw in the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. It'll make your pumpkin stay fresh. And boy, talk about those seeds. You'll be able to pick those out with that weed whacker. Anyway, if you're looking like Wolverine and you haven't cut your nails recently, be sure to look into the Shears 2.0 Nail Kit. Life-changing products from our folks at manscaped.com. And as I mentioned, 20% off and free shipping everything in the place at manscaped.com slash jce manscaped.com slash jce for 20 percent off say trick or treat to your beautiful new halloweeny with manscaped well jim let's get a few more questions in here this week before we wrap things up and before this chair squeaks again a very popular topic i don't know if you've seen this but a lot of people have been wanting to know what you think i guess eric bischoff did a recent interview where he talked about tony khan and several people have sent in these quotes have you seen this at all I saw it and ignored it because I didn't know you were going to ask me about it. So I have not heard his statement, but I would be uh, uh, acquiescent to hearing his comments. This was uh, this transcription was sent to cornydrive at gmail.com from Paul in Nantwich, England. And I guess this is in reply. And to wait, wait, Antwich? Nantwich. Oh. England. I thought Antwich was an offshoot of the Manwich. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that, but this... Only it, was a, it would be a sandwich made by your aunt. I believe that this was in response to Tony Khan's recent comments about Ted Turner and about Vince McMahon, about having more money, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I have more money than you do, so I can do this all day long, and I'm smarter than Ted Turner, but uh, yeah. So Eric Bischoff said, if Tony Khan were to call me and ask me for any advice, here's what it would be. Don't call me and ask for advice, I'm Eric <laughs> Bischoff. No, no, I kid, I kid. I kid. <laughs> Here's what it would be. Shut up and wrestle, dude. Just put on the best product you can, and you've proven you can. Focus on that. Now, this is weird coming from me, right? The guy who challenged Vince McMahon. I was about to say he wrote a book called Controversy Equals Cash and challenged Vince McMahon to a fist fight. He's also talking about himself again. The guy who gave away their finishes. But here's the difference. I was actually competing with him. I was going head to head, real head to head. Like my show started the same time his show started each and every week. And another thing Tony came out and said, quote, and this is him subquoting, I should say, we're at the 96th stage of WCW and we're just going to not make their mistakes. (laughs) Tony, you're inventing some mistakes, brother by coming out there and constantly comparing yourself and deriding your competition, but not having the willingness, I almost said balls, but not having the willingness to say, let's go head to head, let's really compete, let's see who can get whose market share. That's real competition. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, There's a little bit more. Well, but also, but let's put a pause on it. That's not up to Tony Khan either. 
he can't say just put me on against them because TNT or TBS, neither one would do that because they don't want to fucking kill their new program. So they're not going to put them up against Monday Night Raw. That's what Ted Turner did uh, what, 26 years ago or whatever, and that's only because somebody <laughs> caught him on the right day when he just said, well, hell, okay, and he still had the power to do it. So that's a little misleading. Go ahead. Uh, he's going back to the market share thing. That's real competition. So I'm a little disappointed in the rhetoric I'm hearing out of Tony, as well as some of the talent. Shut the fuck up until you're actually competing, and you're actually competing favorably. And by the way, Tony, in 1996, I was kicking WWE's ass every week in a real head-to-head -head competition, not a cosplay competition. Ooh. Um... I I mean, I can't honestly say that I agree with most of that because he uh, Eric is aggrandizing himself and his efforts when he was in a completely different time in a completely different place in a complete, completely different company. Yes, they were competing head to head and viciously with Vince McMahon and the WWF at the time. That is a given. And the competition was much fiercer than it is today that is a given um having said that eric bischoff suddenly found himself in charge of a wrestling company that had a 20 something year history and had been doing mega business for most of that time until the couple of years before he got put in charge of it and that was due to the 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 dark years were due to TBS putting a bunch of people in charge of the wrestling company that didn't know anything about it. Jim Hurd, Kip Fry, blah blah blah. Bill Shaw. Bill Shaw. Um, it's also not fair to compare the 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 Attitude Era '90s head-to-head -head war with this one because let's face it, the talent was a lot more even. Because at that point in time, not only did Vince have one of the greatest rosters top to bottom that he's ever had, but WCW had an incredible roster from top to bottom, including half of the stars they got, they got from Vince. The star power and the talent on both sides was not only, you know, close to even or certainly competitive, but it was deeper than is possible today because there's just not as, as many good main event quality wrestlers today as there was then. <clears throat> there's also, what is it? Is it five times fewer people watching wrestling today than we're watching wrestling then? I'm not sure so, the exact number, but obviously both television viewership declines and specifically wrestling viewership declines, yeah. Yes, yeah, no, I'm just talking specifically wrestling. There were at least five times many, five times more people watching pro wrestling in general in the United States, at least as there was, or in, you know, in the 90s as there is now, today. That's, that's undisputable. So... You know, Eric Bischoff is giving tips for Ty. I think Tony should shut up because he's coming off like, you know, Richie Rich, a spoiled little rich kid. Where's Cadbury? But Bischoff is not the guy to tell anybody to shut up when he challenged Vince to a fight. And he's right. They were legitimately competing main show to main show. But he didn't do that. The company already had 20 something years of history before he got there. The company already had done major business competitive with Vince in the 80s before he got there. And the company was so deep in talent, and he got them. That's the one thing that Bischoff, and I've always given him credit for this, he's the first one to get the Turner Empire to spend actual money on the company. And then the problem was he got them to spend too much. He got them to spend enough that they started, and they hot-shotted, and they got Hall and Nash and they started doing business, and then he talked them into spending so much more that when they couldn't keep up with bringing that amount of money in, it gave the naysayers in the TBS empire that had always wanted to get rid of the wrestling company the ammunition to do it.
when they were only losing eight million bucks, well, to them that was lunch. But when they lost sixty million, then they say, okay, now we can get rid of this fucking thing. But the talent was deeper. There were more fans were plentiful. Wrestling was more popular. So yes, he was competing head to head, but he can't give Tony any advice because the the whole thing has changed. And Tony better be happy with beating NXT by a couple hundred thousand people when they were on Wednesday nights because that's right now and for the foreseeable future as close as he's going to get just because of the head start and the worldwide infrastructure that the WWE has. But as we've mentioned, with them trying to throw the fight and Tony doing everything he can to win it, it's it's kind of working out a little even, but there's you know the WWE still much farther ahead. So I think Eric's advice is wonderful fodder for his podcast to see if, since Tony's the bell of the ball these days and the most beloved billionaire in the world, he's probably going to talk about Tony as much as he can to see if anybody will listen to his podcast. Which, by the way, I don't think does really any business, you know, based on what we know. But well, we'll it's see. out there on the charts. What is, is it? it? Well, yeah. On the sports charts, I think. Well, it must be down low, not you know, well, I, not I, near I, the two biggest shows every single. It was, week. As a matter of fact, the one that I saw this week was kind of uh, poetic justice. He was down at, at number eighty three. Eighty three. I would think that a show that's supposed to be as popular as that one would have a bigger audience. That doesn't make well, any sense. Well, the show is called Eighty Three Weeks. Oh, that is true. So yeah, that is so, true. And that's a free plug, uh, Eric. We give you a free plug here for your little program. Never let it be said that we, that we want to hog all the listeners. Since we have so many, we'd be glad to <laughs> give you a few. Where, where did our programs come in on the sports chart this week, if Eric was at 83? Uh, pretty much every single week. We're in the number one rated wrestling show on the Apple sports charts every single week. Well, no, I'm not uh, talking about I'm not talking about rest because the wrestling chart is a sub. Well, we're not chart, on the wrestling a chart. sub genre. Right. But that's why I'm saying we're on the actual sports charts with yes. basketball and football and baseball. Where were we this week when Eric was at 83? Last week, Jim, the peak for Jim Cornette was 18. Yeah. So we were down a little bit. Down a little bit. We're number 18. Eric's number 83. That sounds about right. On the sports charts. You know, if we were on the wrestling charts, if you actually look and, uh, you know, we've actually that done this. That wouldn't be fair. No, because we would actually be the number one and number two show yeah. every single week for the last couple of years based on every other chart that's out yeah, there. Yeah, that's why we don't do because we're not just we're not just wanting to do the romper room stats. We're wanting to we're playing with the big boys here. So we're on the sports chart. Well, the experience number 18. Where's the drive through at your show? It's been a rough week. Thirty four. It was oh, uh, well, last all time. Right. Eric's yeah. at eighty three. Eighty three. All right. Eighty three. But, you know. Well, maybe we should do something on the wrestling charts to show some people should some real muscle that power. That wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair to anybody them. else. But no, that's what I'm saying. Because if we actually applied to the wrestling chart, we would be one and two every week, and it wouldn't give anybody else a chance. So let them have the wrestling chart, and we'll take the sports chart. I'll say there are certainly a lot of shows out there. They all seem to be somewhat connected. Who really seem to be pretending like there's a big audience for them. But when you actually look at the numbers and the YouTube, it just almost seems like a mythical audience. I don't know. Is mythical? Mythical. Mythical, mythical baby. Mythical, How would Dusty baby. Rhodes say that, Jim? He would say it like mythical. It's mythical, baby. It's mythical. It do not exist. Well, Jim, let's get a few more questions before we don't exist anymore here on this week's show. This next one was sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Charlie in Starkville, <sighs> Mississippi. I shouldn't pile on Ted DiBiase and his family. Oh, boy. But being a proud Mississippian, I'm going to. From their involvement in the biggest embezzlement scheme in Mississippi history. Oh, God. Three when members you say of, it like that, it sounds unsavory. Three members of the DiBiase family have been ordered to pay back stolen welfare money to the state. Ted DiBiase Jr. must repay $3.9 million plus interest. Ouch. Ted DiBiase Sr must return $722,299 that his Christian ministry received. And finally, Brett DiBiase has to repay $225,950. Oh, 
What are your thoughts on the DiBiase family stealing millions in welfare money from the state of Mississippi? Oh, come on. I don't... I, is stealing it a right, the proper word? They didn't, like, go and knock somebody over the head and pick their pocket. They just well, misdirected funds from the state that were to be used for poor people to, for their own ends. I can't that stealing. make it sound any better. <laughs> I like Ted DiBiase. I've never had a single crossword with him. I've never met his sons. And but and and I guess the way this happened was that one of the sons got a job in in the state government or somehow affiliated with the state that could direct this money to potentially proper causes, right? Like Ted and DiBiase instead, Ministries, yes. It, well, no, it, it 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 to proper causes like the welfare of people, poor people, and food, you know, assistance and all that stuff, and it instead got transferred to his brother and his his father's ministry. I mean, everybody knows what if you give some preacher money, then you ought to know what's going to happen to it because it's it's this is a bigger. I'm not trying to bury Ted DiBiase Sr. here. I'm just saying it's a bigger fucking rib than the people who, everybody knows wrestling's fake. Everybody knows a goddamn televangelist or any preacher that's asking for money is going to use it to buy his own air-conditioned doghouse and rocket car because he's preying on people who are gullible enough to believe in some greater power that's going to deliver them from any bad happenings if only they contribute money that they don't have to some asshole who's building a $10 million church and drives around in stretch limousines because God is all knowing and all powerful and all seeing. But as George Carlin has mentioned, he's rotten with money, can't handle money, always in need of money. So, you know, but in this case, it apparently wasn't, uh, contributions that were made wholeheartedly and, and with everybody knowing up front, it was city or state money misdirected to this ministry on behalf of something they were allegedly doing. I don't know. But again, give money to children's charities, give money to animal charities, don't give money to religious charities because it's based on fiction and it's a scam. And they will take your money, and they won't even pray for you. And there's no money back guarantee on what what happens if you've given all this money to all these all these Christian and religious charities all your life, and you die. And when you die, you realize you're not at the pearly gates. You're not talking to Saint Peter. You're in a box in the ground with worms. Do you get that money back? I'm just asking. No refunds. No refunds. So anyway, I don't want to dogpile on the DiBiase family. I'm sorry Ted's in this predicament, but it sounds like he better be the million-dollar man because what would you do if somebody said, told you you need to pay back 700 and something thousand dollars and your son needs to pay back four million bucks? Ah, oh, shit, will you take a check or do I have to run upstairs to get the cash? If you were a newspaper man in Mississippi... You must be salivating. The million dollar man owes millions? Well, no, he doesn't know. His son owes millions. Oh, in a headline, it could million be. Million dollar man junior. Well, it could be million dollar man and family owe millions. Well, <laughs> I, I, I really wish they hadn't done that thing that they did. So we wouldn't have to be talking about it. Because I take no pleasure in poor Ted DiBiase being in trouble. I wouldn't use the word poor Ted DiBiase. Well, I'm talking considering about. Considering the story. Poor. Not poor as in, a man is not poor as long as he has friends. <laughs> not poor in, in wealth, but poor in yeah. in state of, he's in up shit creek without a paddle. Yeah, right poverty now. sucks, Ted DiBiase, more like it, but. Hey, you know, will, this, will this be, will Cameron Grimes bail him out now? <laughs> That's right. That's a good think? question. That's a great question. If Cameron Grimes, if they would just take a camera crew and take Cameron Grimes to the state capitol in Jackson and shoot him on the front steps going to see about doing something for Ted DiBiase, that would be the greatest thing ever on television. If there is a trial, and it will be public because people will know where it's going to be and you'll see Ted and his kids walking in and out, how much do you want to bet Virgil will be on the steps selling autographs? 
I'll put money on it right now. He'll find his way down in Mississippi and he'll be there selling autographs. I don't know. He might be afraid Ted might ask him for a loan. <laughs> That's a good question. But Mr. DiBiase has a lot of problems uh -huh. that are going to be coming in the future. And Sounds I, like he needs a good lawyer. Well, who really cares about what he needs? I'm thinking about the lawyer that the people of Mississippi need, the people who needed that welfare money, the people who were ripped off and lied to, the people who were stolen from. Those people need an attorney. They need an advocate who will fight for them with the same anger I have right here, right now in this spot. And there's only one man, Jim. Only one. Call Stephen P. News. If you need to see an outlaw mud show or two. The rest. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you have been promised a palace at the pearly gates, but all you got was the basement of a porta potty, then you need to call the man, the myth, the legend himself, Stephen P. New, 888 692 8084, or go to newlawoffice.com and you can see the reprobates that he has brought to heel, that he has put in line and brought to justice, who have not only damaged not only stolen from, not only poisoned, or potentially harmed the health of innocent victims all across America. Stephen P. New is the bulldog of justice, the legal beagle, the consigliere of the cult of Cornet, and the man who will take you to the promised land of the pearly gates of payoff. That's right, he'll take you to payoffsville. Because if Stephen P. New, as we've said many times, cannot get you paid, your ass does not accept cash. So whether you've been damaged or downtrodden by some of these greedy or avaricious corporations, if you've been injured in, your, in any way or if anyone in your social circle or immediate family or potentially unknown family, possibly you've got some relatives out there you're not sure of. Maybe you, you were a young man who liked <laughs> to spread your seed around the states. When you were young and now you've got kids you don't even know about, whoever's in the whole group there. Who are you speaking to? I'm just talking to anybody at random. Uh, anybody can can avail themselves of the services of Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. He has brought so many members of the cult of Cornet from travail and trouble to happiness and prosperity. You can be amongst those. The consigliere of the cult of Cornet is standing by. That's right. A great, great man, Stephen P. New. But Jim, let's get one or two more questions before we wrap things up. This next one sent to Corny Drive through at gmail.com from Michael Scriven in Springfield, Missouri. Michael Scriven. Some call it Missouri, but uh, Springfield, well, Missouri. That's, that's uh, Black Bart used to say Missouri. But Michael Scriven was kind and sent me a, a Christmas present, or not a, a birthday present here a while back. Ah, anyway, go ahead. So it's bribery, I see. Well, it's here's bribery. His question. I recently found the scaffold match between Jerry Jarrett and Don Green on YouTube. The scaffold was announced as 12 feet high and 2 feet wide. The match was presented as whoever could knock their opponent off the scaffold twice yes. would win. A referee climbed onto the scaffold during the match because Don Green was using a foreign object. The match lasted three falls. Having seen some of that, I'm wondering how the scaffold match evolved into being so high in the air that fans thought someone might die falling off the scaffold. Well, after Jerry Jarrett invented it, people did, he didn't have to be in the successive ones, so they got hired. <laughs> um, well, can I, before you even go any further, ahead. one quick question, because if it's the same place, how high was the scaffold for Coco versus Dundee? Um, well, I'll tell you. Okay. A lot higher. Um, here's what happened in a nutshell. And by the way, the reason that is on YouTube is because it's off the DVD that comes along with the Tuesday Night at the Gardens book because I have saved that match in my videotape archives. It was originally lost to the Tennessee wrestling office, and it ended up in the hands of Ron Martinez, uh, Pedro Martinez, the promoter, his son, who had PM film and tape, and I was able to get a, him to transfer a bunch of that stuff for me. Jerry Jarrett actually had an old two-inch reel 
uh, a videotape because the match was from 1971 with that on there and had never had it transferred. And I'm not sure if he still even got it or not. So, but nevertheless, I talked to him. We had him on the program one time. He mentioned that the reason why he thought of the scaffold match was because he had seen a, a gladiator movie laid on TV one night where a tree had fallen across this yawning chasm, this canyon, and the two gladiators, one from one side and one from the other side, fought on the tree and one was knocked off into the yawning chaos below, right? He said, can we recreate that in a wrestling ring? And Don Green, his brother Al Green, the mean greens, the heavenly bodies, uh, with their manager Sir Clements, were the top heels in the territory. And they had been screwing around Jerry Jarrett and Tojo Yamamoto for the tag team titles and everything else. So finally, Jerry Jarrett booked a match because he had just opened up Louisville the year before, 1970. It's August 15th, 1971 now, and Louisville has really been coming on and doing good business. And he saw, well, here's a chance to do a heck of a gate. If I have this blow-off match in Louisville, Jerry Jarrett was the most popular babyface there. Of course, he's the booker, so he'd booked himself in that position. And the match was a scaffold match, so that way Al Green couldn't interfere, and Sir Clements, the manager, couldn't interfere. And the deal was that, um, you know, they would have to start on the scaffold, and they would have the match up there, and nobody could interfere with them. Jerry made a mistake in judgment there, being as this was really the first time for this thing. It shouldn't have been the first man to be knocked off twice. But the problem was, he didn't think big enough. The way that they did this, this scaffold match, they literally put two 12-foot stepladders, the foldable outable stepladders in the ring and put a two-foot wide uh, board in between those ladders and they, they fought on that. So it wasn't really a death-defying bump because if you're hanging from the thing, you're you're feet are only four feet off the ground but the way that they promoted it and the way that they advertised it and the fact that it had never been done before and that this was a hot program anyway and everybody and all the everything was on the line the greens uh they put up five thousand dollars and sir clements was barred from the arena's whole big thing so the the two bumps off was like it was like a two out of three fall because all the old matches were two out of three falls back then. But in hindsight, it was a mistake because they should have just made one bump, the the big one. But what they did was instead Don held on and finally had to drop off once or whatever the fuck. But finally, on the last bump off the thing, Green took the bump where he tried to catch himself at, uh, allegedly, and it, he was able because they were leaving the territory or at least he was going to be out for a while. So they were able to say, say when he fell that he broke his arm. I think later on they changed it to wrist on television, but they announced that night, Don Green has broken his arm and the place popped like everybody had just won the lottery. By the way, did I mention they raised the ticket prices for this match? That was the highest ticket prices that they charged in Louisville, Kentucky between 1970 and the mid nineties. Uh, front row ringside was $15 when it was normally uh, in those days, I think three fifty. and they did a golden circle thing and they sold out. They did the biggest gate in Louisville that they did until I want to say maybe until the early eighties, a uh, uh, Lawler and Bachwinkle, or maybe, uh, it might have been when Rough House Fargo came in and they drew 6,000 people Christmas of 82. But anyway. This was before you started going to shows. Yes. When you yes. started going, were people talking about it still? Oh, my God. It was the most famous thing that ever happened. It was that, that deal where, you know, when something happens that later on becomes legendary, everybody that lived in that town at that time was there on that spot and saw it. Yeah. Well, there were only 6,000 people in the building that night because that's all it held, but everybody that ever came to wrestling in the 70s said they were there that night. Um, it was, And the people used to say, oh, back room, because honestly, 
by the time I started coming in 1974, some of the best houses were behind at that point in time because when there had been no, it was like the CM Punk thing. For the wrestling fans in Louisville, they never knew they were actually going to see wrestling again. The town was dark for five years. So at first, when the TV got on, you know, people didn't find it. People didn't really know. But as Jared has said, after he lost money the first few shows that he ran, and then he broke even. But then all of a sudden, people started finding the TV, realizing the matches were going on. They hadn't seen wrestling live in so long. Louisville started being the, you know, the second town behind Memphis in the entire territory pretty quick. It was doing houses that would rival. It was better than Nashville because the building was bigger. And Chattanooga and Birmingham, Birmingham was starting to go downhill. Chattanooga was stronger to the mid 70s. But after Memphis, by the mid, you know, by the mid 70s, Louisville had become the number two town. And everybody that came to the matches in the mid 70s used to go, wow, it used to be filled here every week back in the old days, three years ago. <laughs> But yeah, everybody remembered the scaffold match. Everybody talked about that well into the 80s and beyond. That was the the local wrestling match that everybody remembered. And as as you can see from the video, is the shits of a match because they just sat straddled the the scaffold and on their asses and punched each other and they milked the idea of pushing each other over the edge. As you're watching it, it's the shits. There's nothing going on. But as you're listening to the people in the sold-out building, every time somebody's fucking foot kind of goes over the edge, they're shitting like they're watching a, you know, a baby being sawed in half with a chainsaw. The photos look cool in the Japanese magazine, though. Yeah, it was a cover story in the Japanese Gong magazine because they had one of the photographers was touring the United States at that point, came and saw that match. And they'd never seen anything like it. They even got a, a, a fold-out color pinup of Jarrett hanging from underneath the thing by his hands and feet, trying, Green trying to kick him off, that was a fold-out of the magazine. So it, it, it was definitely it was a big deal. Now, to go to my earlier question... Oh, and then, wait a minute, Coco. And, well, uh, because that's what I was going to say, yeah. yeah. The, one of the most memorable photos, you're talking photos, is that one of Coco hanging off the scaffold, I think. Yeah, with by one hand, yeah. actually four fingers and looking down. Like, here's what happened after that. The next scaffold match they had in Louisville wasn't until 1977, and it was a scaffold match battle royal where they had a battle royal, <laughs> and the last two guys had to go up on a scaffold. And then whoever got bumped off the the way. It was Bill Dundee and Jerry Brown of the Hollywood Blondes. So Jerry Brown probably 50 years old at that time, just in for a little run, didn't give a shit, didn't want to be up there. Dundee could do anything. He was fearless. He, he'd he hang upside down off that thing. If it was 40 feet in the air, he didn't give a fuck. He did the struts. But they did the, the same thing, the ladder and the boards, and it was just, it was a low-budget bleh. But then, 1982, they did Bill Dundee and Coco Ware in Louisville at the gardens. And that was on top of, I think it was Jerry Lawler and Kamala, the Iron Sheik and outlaw Ron Bass. I think Steve Kern and my God, there was a tag team. It was a loaded card, like six, seven matches. They were all, it was great talent. And that was, I think, except for the time Roughhouse Fargo came in that Christmas, that was the biggest house of the year. They did 5,500 people plus. And they've spent the money to have the scaffolding actually put up the, the six foot sections of, of square scaffolding on each side of the ring. And then along before it was just the board in between. And then they put the, and, and the board was on top of a step ladder. So you'd have monkey bars underneath it. Right. Well, for this one, they not only had the scaffold on either side of the ring, but they had a ladder all the way across it. So it was like a 24-foot extension ladder, and they put a board on top of that and put a uh, – this is where we learned this in Louisiana. They put a like a fold-out rubber sheet that – you know, like a 
carpet folded up, except it ran all the way across the thing because that way you couldn't slip and it would cut down on the splinters from the board. And that was easier. So Dundee and Coco, they tore the house down with that one. And that thing was three sections of scaffolding. They're six feet a piece. That's 18 feet. Um, 15, uh, 15 feet off the ring. How come they never tried it in Memphis? If it worked so well every time they did it in Louisville, was it an athletic commission thing? Um, no, because there was a commission in Kentucky, but there was no commission at that time in Tennessee. I don't know. You know, they didn't do the scaffold. Well, they didn't do the scaffold in Memphis till 87 with Lawler and, and, uh, who was it? It was idle and rich against Lawler and Dutch. I forget on the scaffold where, where Paulie wouldn't take the bump. Yeah, that's right. Where Lawler broke his jaw because of it. Yeah. Well, he, he did it afterwards. He didn't do it that night. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's the first scaffold they ever put in Memphis, as far as I can remember, was that match in 87. But anyway, the, the thing with every time they got a budget, every time it drew more money, because then we had had scaffold matches in Louisiana that were patterned after that one. The You know, except that they made it because it was a tag team. They made the four feet wide, two ladders and two boards stretched across. But we got professional scaffolding and everything. But then when we saw the Starcade 86 scaffold, that was eight foot sections. It was 24 feet high. Wow. It was even more <laughs> wow. fucking God expensive damn. to set up. And that's when we went out and looked and I said, fuck me. You know, I, I so did Dusty see the Mid-South scaffold matches or just hear about them? Heard about them. He was not on any of the cards. Right, and I didn't so know. I know there was footage, but I didn't know if he, Dusty he would have been getting any. I I don't know it. I mean, the, the the offices sent video back and forth to each other on occasion when they sent the Flair DiBiase Mid South TV match, the famous one, the great one where they switched TB, DiBiase babyface. November eighty five, yeah, yeah, and DiBiase bled like a faucet from the post and the whole thing. They sent that to Crockett in Charlotte. And Jackie Crockett was running camera for interviews one day. And he came in and he said, did you see the fucking, he's asking Gene Anderson, did you see the fucking tape Watts sent us? And Gene rolled his eyes and twitched at the same time. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, oh, it's Flair and DiBiase from their, and I'd already seen it because this was early 86. I'd gotten the tape. I said, that's a great match. He said, we can't show that. We can't put that on any of our television. Because Watts was on TV in Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma. Crockett's on TV in Charlotte, North Carolina, and all over Virginia, the home of every evangelist and religious crackpot in the world. And they could they couldn't even they couldn't even run it in black and white. It was so gory. Was the original intention for them to run that match off Mid South TV on Crockett TV? They sent it because they were going to do something with Flair and DiBiase somewhere. I know they got it, and I know they watched it, and I know they hated it, and they couldn't air it. Well, Flair and Butch Reed was pretty good the week before. Um, but anyway, so where were we going with all of this? So the scaffold. So yes, yeah, so every time that it was a bigger show and they got a bigger budget, the thing got fucking taller. And then remember, they went completely insane in Dallas when they were trying to draw a house at the stadium, maybe the last stadium show they drew, and they had a scaffold that must have been 30 or 40 feet high. Remember that? Vaguely. You saw, yeah. you saw the pictures, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> I think Eric Embry had something to do with that one. Yeah, then, you know what? Now that you say that, that sounds exactly right. Yeah. yeah. It is a fuck. So it, it, I'll I'll just, I'll wrap it up by saying this. The scaffold matches when they were done in the territories drew huge houses for the most part. They were shitty matches and the people didn't care as long as the heel fell off. But now in this environment, it, and and or like the XPW scaffold and all the in the ECW scaffold, all that bullshit, that's just been a waste of time and a chance of killing somebody. Because the only reason that the scaffold match drew was if you could get a heel with enough heat on him that the people legitimately wanted to see him fall and die. And I'm not making that up, and you can testify to that. <laughs> And I mean, even you you weren't old enough to be there in the Carolinas in the eighties, but those people were pissed that we didn't break our necks. They were legitimately offended. I was hospitalized. So that took some of the heat off of it. 
But otherwise, if I hadn't been hospitalized and they come out and said so on TV, a lot of the people were hot. They wanted to see us thrown off and killed. And if you don't want, if you can't find a heel that the people hate bad enough that they want to see them injured severely, if not, you know, fucking killed, don't have the scaffold match because there's no other reason. Because they suck and they're the shits. But they always drew in the territories. And now they can use crash pads, so we'll see what happens. But Jim? Yeah, that would have been interesting also. That would have been nice. If instead of having a Big Bubba, if I could have had a crash pad or a my pillow, I would have enjoyed that much better. Go ahead. Well, you might have gotten hurt if you landed on a my pillow. But Jim, this is our final question. Said the corny drive through at gmail.com from Mark in Moberly, Missouri. Or what? Was, uh, Moberly. M O B E R L Y. Moberly. All right. Missouri. That sounds like mopery. It does not sound like mopery, but I somehow you know, you knew know where mo- you were going to you know go. What mopery is, don't you? I do. That's a that's an that's an old charge of vagrancy in the South. Mopery, you were moping around. Although it's always interesting in Revenge of the Nerds when they're in the police station and there's a guy in a trench coat who's been arrested for mopery, and Booger says, "What's mopery?" and the cop says, "Exposing yourself to a blind person." <laughs> So apparently there's multiple meanings. Actually, to- Sputnik Monroe, that's what he got picked up for in the black cafes on Beale Street. Mopery and attempted gawking. That's what they came up with to arrest him because he was white and he was drinking with the black people. Attempted gawking, not even gawking. Not even gawking, but attempted gawking. Luckily, there was no conspiracy to gawk. But uh, Jim, here's the question from Mark in Moberly, Missouri. What do you think about the rumor of Triple H going to AEW? What? I would your thought, I guess like, I would like your thought on what he could do to make it better and what he could do to make it worse. What the? What would the impact of Triple H going to AEW be on the war? Oh, Christ. Do we need to, are we really going to go that far out in fantasy land that, that I need to extrapolate on something that doesn't have a snowball's chance in a hot oven of taking place? I think you may have to only because this is not the only question that has been sent in. I don't know where these rumors are circulating. What, who's going to, no, what, come on. Who's going to believe this rumor? Why? But that's, that's ridiculous. You're just opening yourself up to charges of stupidity and attempted gawkery. If you believe for one second <laughs> that Triple H, whether whether they're, you know, spanking his wrist ab- about NXT or not, is going to go to AEW. How w- wouldn't it be awkward up in Greenwich at the at the dinner table at Christmas time if he was to go to AEW? Honestly, if he went to AEW, don't you think that's finally the point of, you know what? I'm sick of Vince. I'm sick of all this shit. <laughs> I don't want to go to that family dinner anymore. I want a normal family. I'm sick of these billions of dollars. I I want a checking account like I had 30 years ago when I had $2,472.14. He's got a nice checking account now, and there's another guy with billions of dollars who's looking for friends. Oh, for heaven's sake. No, no, no. I, 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 can't, I can't imagine what he would do right and what he would do wrong or what he would help and what he would hurt because the concept of that is so ludicrous in my mind. Um, and if, but if you do run with it, well, he ain't going to be wrestling because he just had a fucking heart attack and he's 50. Oh, well, maybe that makes him perfect to be, to be an announcer in <laughs> AEW. Now that I'm thinking about it, he's, as a matter of fact, where's Lawler? Why the fuck ain't Lawler on TV in AEW? He died from a heart attack, and he's 72 years old. He should be their lead announcer. Um, I, I don't, he's not, he wouldn't be a wrestler. Uh, I would say that he would be in shape to have a match or two every once in a while if he hadn't just, as I mentioned, had a heart attack. So a it, coronary uh, episode or, or whatever it was. What was the cor- name of it? A coronary event. That's what it was. Like a rain event. Um, as an executive, well, he'd fit in with all those <laughs> other executives. They would all band together to fucking draw him and quarter him in the town square because they all would hate him. And by the way, cardiac, not coronary. Now that I think coronary, about it. cardiac, whatever. Um. So all all the 
All the indie-rific vice presidents would hate him. Uh, but Cody would, would be happy. Punk would probably go home. That's true. And say, you know what? I thought this was a, a safe environment. I didn't know you were bringing in the cancers, you know, uh, to the locker room. Uh, I, I can't. It wouldn't work. There wouldn't be anything there that it, it, the people, the fans would not want Triple H to be involved with that show because the only reason they're there watching the Hey Kids, Let's Put On a Show Amateur Hour is because the established industry leader sucks pond water and has for so long and is dicks to everybody and the fans hate them because they're heels. So why would what you if Shane really McMahon showed up there? You know, if Shane came out and said, you know, I've been trying to get away from my old man for 25 years and do my own thing, and he wouldn't listen to me about the UFC, and he's done all this other wrestling shit, and now I'm here because I want to see this succeed, they'd probably carry him out of their uh, building on their shoulders. I wanted to buy ECW. I wanted to buy the UFC. Yeah. And he gave it all to my sister and her dumb husband. Yeah. I'm with Punk. Yeah, yeah. It, would, it would go over great. Yeah, Shane, it it would work if Steph, and then if Stephanie came out, there'd be snipers. <laughs> they would fucking despise her. She could just hide behind Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that puts it to bed. Triple H will not be going to AEW at this time. But at this yeah. time, Jim, we will wrap things up. This chair squeaks, and the drive-through is closed. Of course, it's still fucking squeaking. Of course, you can hear us on The Experience when it debuts sometime this weekend. And of course, next week, right back here on The drive Through, you can go through the classic episodes of The drive Through and The Experience by becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash Cornette. The archive of the show is going back to 2013. Available right now. Patreon.com slash Cornette. Get access to full episodes, clips of episodes, omnibus collections, and of course the very popular Travis Heckle artwork, as well as the many guest artists who have been contributing art to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Subscribe today, join up, and check out these clips. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll be the very first thing that pops up. We are very popular. The official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the. You're Jim also Cornette. very humble. I Very am, humble. you know what they call me? The wild bull of the pompous. <laughs> you can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> I can't even talk that. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Don't forget about Cornette's collectibles at jimcornette.com. Or should they forget about it? I always forget. Well, don't forget, but just put it in the back of your mind while I'm filling the current orders. At jimcornet.com. The drive through is brought to you by the Law Office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until this weekend on The Experience, and next week right back here on The drive through for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Pompothity!